we're recording, so shout out to the VODers. I just uploaded the first part of the Dose playthrough on the VOD channel, so that's up there. Thank you, Miku. Um, and we are going to be continuing today with the second part of the Jacob video. The idea is that for as many days as we have to do this reaction to the video, we're going to be doing uh, a, a playthrough of Dose in between, and then once the video is done, we're just going to do Dose the entire way through. The idea of Dose is to beat the, the village, right? So we should be able to get that done pretty fast. Yeah, I, I, I definitely see like the Odegaran from it, but that's not, that, this wasn't like Monster Hunter inspired. The light the lighting makes your hair look super gold. It does, yeah, I know the lighting makes it like it's not. It doesn't look like this. Like this almost looks like a filter, right? But it's not. It, it, it doesn't look like this in real life. It's just the lighting. Um, it's more... It is a gold blonde, but it's not this gold. I don't know why the light's doing that. But yeah, welcome to the stream. What is the dose video? Have you not been watching uh, the VODs? There's a, there's a VOD of the first part, but the dose... Okay, if people don't know, and you haven't watched like the first part of the video, there's a three and a half hour dose video monster hunter dose it's, it's about how monster hunter dose is the what does he say it, apparently it's how monster hunter forgot its genre monster hunter 2 dose review and we made it through the opening the ice cream analogy part zero part one and part two we are now on part three which is all about immersion the the vod channel is called super vods i think i have a link for it I think you can just say VODs. Is it VOD? Yeah, there you go. That should lead to it. Oh shit, I just realized though. Actually, let me... Let me fix it real quick because it doesn't immediately show you the... It doesn't immediately show you the, the playlist. I'll quickly, I'll quickly go to the channel and fix that. Because I just, that just means I just have to add the playlist as a section. Single playlist. Monster Hunter Dose. I think it gets put all the way at the bottom. Yeah. And I'll just move it up. There we go. So the first part of this video series and the first playthrough part are up. So you can go watch those after if you need to get caught up. So we'll publish this. There we go. That's fixed. And I will also change this to be this. Okay. Music's done. We're going into the video. Oh yeah, there's only two mainline games, apparently. Apparently there's only Monster Hunter Dose and uh monster hunter one and then everything else is considered a portable game so we'll see what that's all about let me swap over jacob's thesis seems to be that mh2 has two parts the hunting simulator and the action game and that recent titles have been heavily leaning into the latter at the expense of the former and that dose is the epitome of purely being the former um i i would say that that is a good I would say that you have taken his like really whack ass thesis <laughs> and condensed it into to what I think is like the true the thesis of the video. And and again, no shade to Jacob, and don't be mean to Jacob, please. Like I don't like when you guys are mean to him. He just he has some whack takes, but nice dude. Um, and I guess now that we're playing those two, I do see some of the stuff that he was talking about. Um, but what was it? What was I going to say? Um. I, I do agree, like, like with what Kermit wrote there, I do agree with that, like, f from, like, Gen, from, like, Gen Ultimate up, f f probably from Cross and Double Cross up, I would say that this series is very heavily leaning that way. I wouldn't say that 4 was too leaning that way, and I wouldn't say that the third gen at all lent, leaned that way. I think I think the third gen and, and Monster Hunter 4, I think the third gen and Monster Hunter 4 perfected the balance between action and the hunting simulator genre, if, if that's what we're going to be calling it during this video. I think it was perfected then. 
For you wasn't too much of an arcade action. For you wasn't too much of an arcade action game, in my opinion. Yeah, it was not. I agree. It had a, it had plenty of prep. There was plenty of preparation that needed to be done for me, but I was also playing that completely solo. That's another thing um, that I brought up in the first part of this video. Uh, Jacob does this video through the lens, unless it changes at some other point in the video from part from from the start to part two to the end of part two this has been completely through the lens of a solo player that is not interacting with the online experience at all and and that while it is impossible currently to interact with the online experience it it, it kind of fatally flaws a lot of the observations that are made unfortunately it's it's not like he could help it because you can't really like you can't really do that right now but like some of the observations he's trying to make you have to, they don't necessarily work if you consider the online component of the game um and we might see some of that stuff like money issues and uh time spent and stuff like that you know people most people treat village as a tutorial and maybe for resources focusing on hub i i don't know about like I don't know about Dota because I only just started playing Dota, and I don't know about um, I don't know about the original like first gen, but like Village is much more than just a tutorial for sure. Like like Village becomes Village is a lot of stuff. Like it it it, it it's a means to break into Hub for sure, but it's also like you said like you're you generally have like your farm or something like that. You have um, various things. Various sometimes it like unlocks canteen upgrades. Some like sometimes it unlocks like certain armor things or like different different stuff. Like canteen upgrades in tr three ultimate are the biggest example I can think of. Some of them are village specific, right? So in in Rise, I would say yeah, it's pretty much just a tutorial. It's a very it's like a two hour tutorial. I don't think it's I don't know if it's actually two hours. I, that's probably just I'm being. I'm not being facetious, but I am exaggerating. But you know what I mean. But I love Village, and like I would always recommend that everybody gets through the Village, even if you decide to do Hub first and you go through the Village overpowered. Like, still do the Village, because you'll almost always unlock something that's useful to you for the rest of the game. Maybe not in Dose, because this game really just said like, say said fuck you, and like. Actually, that, that reminds me because we were talking about um, there was there was a point Jacob made in the video where he was talking about how um, it was the developer's intention to have like limited space in your box and to not let you send stuff back to the box after a quest, which is insane. That, that is just like the worst decision in a game I've ever seen. Um, that's not even Jacob's fault. That's just the developers fucked up there. Um, and... I mentioned, similar to the rotating quest system, that a lot of that could be due to memory limitations and stuff like that. Um, but I was talking to, on my last stream, I was talking to the guys that did the break arts patch, and you know they can actually get into the game and look at some of that stuff. Apparently, you can force certain things like that within the game. Like You could have stacks of 99 items. You can't stack 99 items in this game, but you could potentially force it to and you could potentially force it to show all quests and stuff like that so it, it it's a question of did the developer intend to do this before the experience did they did they do it as a means of like limiting things here and there for the sake of like virtual memory or did they just not think about it you know did they just did it just not come to them yet little things like that there's there's little there's little um things like that you have to consider so like, like not everything like everything is developer intent but like what was the intent they did it on purpose what do you mean do you what do you mean hey jacob jacob's here this is why i said don't be rude to jacob he's gonna show up beat your ass I definitely believe being on the PS2 with like the PS2's limited uh, memory resources and stuff like that, that they had to be, uh, they had to make some decisions here and there. Things like the the box, for example. But I, I mean, I am willing to be proven wrong on that. If there's like an interview or something, I would love to see that. 
There's an interview. There's an interview that says they wanted to the game to be brutal. If anything, it was lazy coding. If anything, it was lazy coding. I see. I, okay, I'll, I'll I'll go with that. I 100% could believe that. I 100% could believe it was lazy coding. I would love. I would also love to see that interview. Also, what was the other thing we were like really like doubling down on that Jacob said? Oh, the money issues. Yeah, the money issues. I refuse to believe there's money issues in this game once you get to the late game or the mid game even. It's not memory limitations at all. Show me show me the interview where they say that they purposefully made the box like have like what is it like four pages you get and that you can't stack 99 items. Because like could you stack 99 items in monster hunter one or monster hunter g like and and additionally wait, did portable come out before dose or after dose actually let me look that up mh portable was not portable third i just want portable sorry hold on no don't show me portable show me freedom thank you Freedom came out in 2005, uh, December 1st, 2005. Monster Hunter 2 came out in 2006. Okay, so Portable came out. Could you stack 99 in Portable? In Freedom? Maybe it was in Evo, it was just their game philosophy. I feel like a lot of the philosophy definitely came, th th this is what I'm saying. Portable 1 doesn't allow you to send items to boxes. Does, does Monster Hunter 1 and G allow you to do that? Because, like, my, my thought process is this, is this is how I reasoned it out based off of, and I want to get into the video, but, like, the way I reasoned it out, or, like, as a theory, you know, the first game to do that was Portable 2nd. Jesus Christ. That, that, this, this is what I'm saying, is, like, I, I, I agree that they wanted the game to be, like, brutal, as you put it, and I, but I would, I would love to see the interview for that, but I, I can't imagine that they, they saw how much, like, I, I can't ima imagine that they looked back in hindsight. I think that's what we said last time. It was a hindsight thing that they looked back on how they could improve the game. And they were like, like, I guarantee like the, the conversation was like, they were. They looked at the box system and they were like, "Why the fuck can't you stack ninety nine of these? Like, this is crazy. Like, what? What were we? Why did we do this?" And it's and uh, sometimes, again, theory is uh, obvious. So obviously, they wanted to change it. Yes, obviously, they want to change things. When you look back at something and you realize that it was like poo poo garbage, you want to change it. You know what I mean? Like. When a, when a developer looks at something that they did in the past, in hindsight, they, what wasn't initially a problem to them before, something they never even really thought about, becomes a problem, and then they look to fix it. You know, they look to improve on it. Stack size isn't that easy. Having two stack sizes with double active memory, and if it's always loaded, we talked we talked to the break arts guys about this, and like because we're talking we were talking about. Um, how there's a patch that's uh there's the there's the patch that changes the controls right it makes them like button based and i that the person that made that patch is trying to make it so that you can stack 99 items in it and the break arts guys also said that they could completely remove the rotating quest system and just have all the quests listed and i don't know i, I i'm curious if that would work on base hardware um cuz if it does then like like what is it a memory issue like it, is it not a memory issue at that point were they just being conservative in certain aspects for like the sake of it you know things like that like a lot of their games are very finely tuned especially back then i wouldn't say as much now though they are making stuff on the their re engines really good so they do they, they are very good at like optimization and stuff like that P3 looks great as fuck. P3 is great. P3 is like, in my opinion, the best portable game is Freedom Unite, but Portable 3rd is the second best, I think. Second G slash Freedom Unite was the first game in the franchise to allow sending to box and stacking to 99. Exactly. But, but what I am saying with that is I think that that is something that they finally looked back on hindsight and were like, this is not a great 
mechanic. This is kind of like not how things should be done. You know how like sometimes they look at things and they're like, how there's a, there's like two reasons that changes happen sometimes. And when, when you're seeing something be improved on from like the prequel to the sequel or whatever, from the original to the sequel, um, it's kind of like, it's like what, what things are really obtuse and bad from a design perspective that would make for a better player experience and how can we fix those, you know? And then you have on the other side, they're like, what new things do we just want to introduce and try? Right. Cause like monster hunter world tried to look at like, like it looked at like the menuing system and the shortcuts and like they added like the radio menu and stuff because they wanted to fix they wanted to fix and advance some of the limitations of their previous UI system, right? But then in terms of additions, you know, they added like a bunch of new stuff. They added like, what, like sliding. Uh, it was a more open, natural, dense map. Uh, we had like climbing and like, well, we had climbing at four ultimate, but like, you know what I mean, right? Like there's those two categories, maybe maybe more categories if you, if you really wanted to like be specific, but you know what I mean, right? So, all of this to say is like I just I don't I, I I can't imagine and like like maybe it is true right like I don't know I don't know I am theorizing but I cannot imagine that they look back at the the limitations of the inventory system in in Monster Hunter Dose and are like yeah that that was both intended and and was good for what we were trying to do with that game, you know? But at the same time, uh, I think as Jacob pointed out, they did make Resident Evil, and, like, that game is, like... Though, that is a much more involved inventory management system, right? Like, Resident Evil is, like, a, a big part of that game is inventory management. You know what I mean? So, there, that is a good argument to it, too. I'm playing it now, Jacob. I'm playing it now. I'm playing it now. I'm playing it. We played our... We did our first session of it, um... When, when was it? This last on Monday? Resident Evil is half inventory, half dodging zombies. Exactly. Anyway, we're in part three, Jacob. You hated it too at first, and then it clicked. I mean, that's fair. That's fair. And the, the, wait, you made. Wait, don't tell me you're, you made the video over the inventory system. That's too much, man. That's too much. Yeah, RE4 Remake had the auto sort. Actually, I, I truly believe that game should not have had the auto sort. I truly believe it should not have had the auto sort. Like, that was a big factor of RE4. Like, why even have it at that point if, if you're going to have auto sort, right? Why even let me place the stuff in my box a certain way if I can just auto sort it? Just, just, just a weird inclusion. It didn't ruin the game or anything, obviously, but, like, it really, like, showed you that this remake is, like, different in ways that you don't always immediately realize anyway this would be a long video can you guys hear this make sure you can hear it uh, i wasn't kidding this next part is on immersion in the last part i stressed the unique systems time of day and season cycles uh, the whole hunting reward business and the item box system because the uniqueness of monster 2 dos within the franchise can be viewed as an attempt to create greater immersion for the player at least i view it that way I mentioned immersion at the beginning of the video. Now, look, immersion is a subjective quality. How immersed you are will be different. <laughs> it's actually, Jacob, just just so you feel better about that, um, I I look back at like the complete Monster Hunter history series, and I hate I hate how I made that video. I hate how I made that video. It's very um, I don't know. There, you can see a big difference between how I how I convey myself in the history videos and how I convey myself in the New Vegas video, as an example. So I'm I'm actually very interested to see your Monster Hunter Four Ultimate video because uh, people told me you made that one. Let's see how that one went. What the differences are for every individual player. However, the game developers will make deliberate choices in their game design the to intentionally attempt immersion. The more the game acts like real life, a simulator game, the more likely the experience can be potentially immersive for the player. Whenever I agree. Auto sort is an accessibility function. That's fair. Sure, sure. But like, 
I don't know. That, that we're in two different topics right now. Auto sorter is an accessibility function. Like I'm, I'm not like saying like remove it, but I, I do think it was a weird feature. But like if it helps people access the game because for some reason the sorting process is is hindering them, then like whatever, that's fine. <laughs> like whatever. Um, I I agree that the developers make intentional design decisions in order to make a game more immersive. It doesn't always have to be a simulation though. Um, there are very fantastical games that are like they completely like um like so far from reality like i would say oblivion as an example since i'm making the video that game is very much not a simulation game by any means but it's also uh, a very immersive experience and and not that jacob's saying this but like do you guys remember i'd say it was around when skyrim came out like, do you remember how important immersion was to dudes online? Like, it was crazy. And I'm, like, I'm not saying, like, immersion isn't a nice thing to have, but it's, it's definitely not, like, a crucial... Like, every game had to have immersion. Every game had to have immersion to people, or it was just not a good game. There, there was just this, like, huge fad of it. Yeah, it was, a, it was a buzzword for a long time. And I'm not saying that's, that's this. It just reminded me of that. It was, it was hugely... Yeah, overvalued and like, I, I the best way I could put it is like like I cared about it a lot at that time too, um because I remember I was like it was back when I used to I don't smoke anymore but I used to smoke a lot of weed and I used to get I used to get really high and the game to play was like Skyrim because it would just like you would like just like like insert yourself into that game and like I always remember this one scenario where there was a there's like a dungeon you go through i don't remember which one exactly but like you get i'm like blitzed out of my mind and you get into a you get into a big room and while you're while you're walking through that room and like an army of skeletons spawn and then like this giant dragon like skeletal dragon spawns and like i i remember that like i got water on my shirt but i remember that like blowing me my mind like blowing, like I really felt like I was in there and like dealing with it. Like nothing else around me was like registering at the time, you know. So, immersion's a great thing, and like it definitely is. Uh, it's just I remember a time where it was like super overvalued. Whenever the game shows itself to be a video game, the more it will be potentially less immersive for the player. There's no guarantee it's going to be immersive for the player, but Capcom can at least attempt to try and make it more potentially immersive. For example, in Monster World, when they remove the loading screens in between the zones on a map, this theoretically may create a more immersive experience because now the player is in face of a loading screen all the time. Yes. Monster World has improved certain immersive elements within the series, though I don't want people to misunderstand Monster World as being the best or most immersive experience in the series. Having. I like. I would say it is. I would say that world technically from a design standpoint is the most immersive game in the in the series and like i'm like the i hate world guy even though i don't even i don't even hate the game and i'm the i hate world guy hey mobuli good to see you are anime girl upskirts immersive <laughs> that's funny and monster hunter does not suck drunk suck while you're drunk. I told, I, I've talked about it before, but like me and Fly Ann used to just get like plastered and just like grind Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. It was awesome. The HUD and some design decisions trashing the whole thing. I would say like Monster Hunter's biggest hiccup with like immersion was like the zones for sure. And, and their entire UI system just really like takes you out of it, you know? Yeah, in some ways, yeah. Like I, and like, I'm sure this is gonna go in like, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but like, I'm sure this is going to go in like you, like Monster Hunter World is not the most simulation based game because, or like immersive based game because like the, there's more simulation based immersion within Dose or something like that, which I, I, I would say as an overall package, this is just way more immersive for people. And like, and like, <laughs> again, because immersion is so highly valued, this like, this is one of the reasons this game ended up selling like a million bajillion copies higher quality animations or not that that means it's a better game in my eyes obviously i, I 
I think like it's selling a million copies doesn't matter. Textures does not equal a more immersive environment. That's ultimately a subjective opinion. If seeing a Jacob, fix your frame rate, please. Please fix your frame rate. I think you I think you say in this video that you're gonna have to get a better computer. I hope you got that better computer, Jacob. A higher quality image causes an individual to be more immersed. That's up to the individual to decide. A stronger point can be made to the interactions between nice. the environment and the active models within them. Within every Monster Hunter title, the active models being the players, NPCs, and monsters all actively interact with one another. When a player approaches an animal, it is designed to interact with the player in some way. Having different interactions is what generates a more believable and- in, in some way? The, the, from what I have seen in Dose, the only way that they interact with you is by kicking your shit in, like like nonstop harassment. It's so like nothing in that game is friendly. It's so it's so torturous. So far, the the best boys were like the worst. That was the worst. Thus, immersive world. Specifically, when player inputted actions change this was, oh, the this interaction between the player That's and right. the animal, it also lends itself to be a more immersive environment. The big point I want to make here. Bullfango was an actual threat. It was crazy. Here, and I'm going to put it up on the screen here. No matter how good the picture looks, it's only a picture. The moment the player can actively interact with the picture is when it becomes an immersive world. Monster Hunter World. Bro, what is. Jacob. What is this? What's going on here, man? Come on. World is not any more immersive than any other title in the series. Furthermore, for every immersive concept that the developers attempted to add in Monster Hunter World was alongside the removal of other immersive concepts already present within the series. Monster Hunter World added Turf Wars, which was just a fancy name for infighting between monsters. Yes. This is also in Monster Hunter Rise. Large yes. monsters will usually attack yeah. each other just if they happen to bump into one another. Turf wars are a specific little animation that deals massive damage. I, I know, and like I, I've said, I try to like disclaim this at all times, but I say like you know he doesn't necessarily. I don't know what he does believe in and doesn't believe in anymore, but a lot of this, a lot of this is uh, apparently not accurate to the the feelings currently, and may not have been conveyed as well as you would have liked. This has been integrated into- Oh no, wait, Jacob, did you watch the first video, man? There's a scene where, oh man, that was so funny. That was so funny. I love, I love Gaijin, but like, man, you shredded him. It was so funny. It was so funny. The gathering, the gathering quest section. Oh my God. Oh my God, dude. That was crazy. That was crazy. I love that. The game's balance and the monster health numbers reflect the player's ability to stage a turf war. In Monster Hunter 2 Dos, if a Rathian enters a Velociprey nest in the jungle, the Velociprey will attack the Rathian. There has always been monster infighting, and damage being dealt between monsters has always- Yeah, there's there's been monster infighting, but like, I th the, the large monsters fighting each other, I believe, was new to world. I don't think large monsters really fought each other necessarily. They dealt damage to each other, but I don't think they fought each other always been a feature in the game. Only now is it more prominent. Look, we can consider Turf Wars to be an improvement to this immersive experience, absolutely. However, now small monsters rarely engage the large monsters. Yes, that is a, that is a fair criticism. W Rise is the worst one for that, I think. Be I think Rise is like the absolute worst for that. And the Turf Wars aren't always smooth. They are very specific gimmick animations. As for the hunting zones, Monster Hunter World advertises itself as a living, breathing world. Monsters feed on each other and interact with one another. Raphalos attacks and kills Aptonoff in the first game. This isn't a new feature by any means. Yes, Actually, with how correct. fast Monster Hunter World wants the player to hunt monsters, I found monsters hunting one another to be a rare experience compared to Monster Hunter 3. Actually, why do, do they, do they, um, pre-gen 3? Pre-exhaustion. What's what's the rules to get an Arathalos to eat something? Like, how does that work? What, what's the rules for that? 
Because I'm pretty sure in Gen 3, it's like they get exhausted, and then once they're exhausted, they will fly to another location to eat, and you're supposed to follow them to, like, get an opening, you know, and a, a drop. They won't hunt a monster. Won't they... They won't, do they feed on a monster in, in one? I think you just showed footage of it. Yeah. They will naturally eat from a carcass, but they he killed it. He killed this, right? World. Monsters feed on each other and interact with one another. Raphalos attacks and kills Aptanoff. Oh, is this a cutscene? Oh, okay, so they didn't do it. Oh, okay. Ah, uh, so it was a Gen 3 thing. In the first game, this isn't a new feature by any means. Actually, with how fast Monster the World wants the player to hunt monsters, I found monsters hunting one another to be a rare experience compared to Monster Hunter 3. Ah. In Monster 2 Dos, I found the Raphalos and Rathian's daily routines fascinating. They will drink water, patrol their nest, and even sleep on their own terms. Mon they drink water? Monster Hunter World did not do any of this first. Monster Hunter World advertises the concept of endemic life, smaller creatures that aren't considered monsters. This is also silly, because smaller creatures have been around since Monster Hunter 1 as well. The lobster in the old jungle actually interacts with the player character. Fish take up a large number of the endemic life entries in Monster Hunter World. That, this is, this is, this isn't a fair argument, I don't think. I don't think that's a fair argument. The, the big the big difference of world's endemic life and the endemic life in this game is like the huge interaction with the endemic life now. Like you can actively collect the endemic life now. Some of them actually have utility in the fights and stuff like that, like the dung beetles and stuff like that. Like sure you have the lobster here that'll jump away from you and you can fish, which you can also do in world. But then we had actively collecting endemic life and like taking pictures of endemic life. And there, that was a huge new feature for the series that they, they had a completely new focus on it. And fish have always been around. Insects have also always been around. They were just smaller and didn't show up visibly the same way they do in World. So in this way, Monster Hunter World did improve because it lets the player see more of these creatures in higher detail, including the bugs being caught. Monster Hunter World did slightly improve the interactions on the hunting maps, but to say that these concepts were never there before is absurd. And D Did they say that? Did they, did they say that they were never there before? Did I, did I miss that? Because, like, I, I feel like they didn't make that claim. I feel like they were just like, shit is bigger and better than it has ever been before. Now you can interact with the endemic life. Now you can now you can see the thunderbug or whatever, you know? I, 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 now it's a more alive-feeling world. That doesn't mean that, like, they are the, they're saying they're the first ones to make Rathalos drink water or anything like that. While they did improve the fidelity of the oh, thing- Oh, he's doing it, okay. ...who are physically looking at- I have never noticed that. I did not know they The actual water. hunting mechanics continue to be streamlined, removing simulator qualities. My previous points on single item box systems, limited item space, the significance of time of day or season, the significance of hunting being the player's job and source of money, are all also elements of immersion that are missing now. In the beta trailer footage for Monster Hunter World, it showcases a hunter tracking an Anjanaf, and eventually it uses the Anjanaf to deliberately attract a Legiacrus, the larger predator. It's Legiacrus. You're so close to getting it right. It's Legiacrus. Legiacrus. So close, though. So close. Probably, like, the closest one I've seen that hasn't said it my way. Um, I definitely agree that... I definitely agree that having realistic mechanics can help lend to immersion. I agree with that. Um, but I don't think the hyper limitations of your box are... No, Kermit, it's Legaya Cruz, I swear to God. I don't think the hyper limitations of your box are necessarily like realistic or whatever. Like, technically speaking, it's it's like saying... I can only put 10 potions in this chest. I can put any combination of stuff I want, but one stack has to be 10 potions. Additionally, I can only buy four normal pickaxes and only three old pickaxes. Like, like that limitation is so random and obtuse that it, it almost breaks the immersion for me. It like, 
it like takes me out and makes me realize that I'm playing a game because I am now questioning I am now questioning the designer's decisions for the mechanics of the game, you know? The best way I think is to, I think it's to have a good balance. And it, it's funny that it's being compared to like Rise and World because like they just, they went off the fucking rails with items. Like they made, they made it, there, there needs to be some form of interaction with your chest so that like, you feel like you're interacting with your inventory. You want you want some of that, right? You want to feel like it's item management. Capcom's really good at item management. You want to have some item management. You want it to be like a balance between having item management and having freedom. Um, and like, I feel like Dose goes two on one side and then Rise goes two on the other side. And so it was probably around Portable 2 or Freedom Unite or whatever that we got, like we started to get that good balance that I personally appreciate. And I think at that point, when you have that balance where like nothing's too crazy on either end, that's when you hit like a good, um, a, a good way of facilitating a player having an immersive experience. There. This is a high level interaction between the player for an and the that environment. Doesn't need to exist. That is completely. Bro, are you straw manning right now? I can't believe this. Missing in Monster World. Theoretically, the player could wait for the larger predator to seek out a meal. I will. I will agree. You're you're basically like, well, like you said, you're making an argument. For, there's, there, this argument doesn't exist. I don't think anybody's like arguing that like, I, that's not true. People that started with World would probably argue. Some people that started with World would probably argue that it's like the mer most immersive game in this series. But like, I also think it's technically the most immersive game in the series, even though it's flawed in certain aspects that actually take away from that immersion. And simply wait near its prey, uh, whatever the prey animal may be, such as an aptonite. I agree. However, this tactic literally can be found in Monster Hunter One. The G player is not actually interacting with the prey monster, they are simply waiting. There is a huge difference between waiting for a monster to arrive, compared to forcing a monster to trigger another monster to arrive. In huh? Monster World, it is possible to force a monster to trigger a turf war with another monster by purposefully luring one to the other. I concede there, this is actively forcing a monster to interact with another monster. This is good, we need more of this. Turf wars unfortunately are... I consider them gimmicky. A little pop-up occurs where the player is rewarded points, for some reason. The animation between monsters is difficult to cancel or interrupt, and ultimately the animation delivers itself to the player as damage dealt above all else. It is not structured as a mindful interaction between nature, but rather the equivalent to detonating a number of barrel bombs and getting rewarded for it. You're like, you're making a good point here, but like, I feel like there's, there's the issue is that, uh... Like you, you point it's be it's point out point it's pointed out that the idea of being able to lure another monster to one monster in order to distract them is is a cool mechanic because that is potentially something that would happen. Two active threats would run into each other, and they would like like in theory turf wars turf wars are cool, right? And like they're flashy and like they're 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 great. But I I do also I actually agree that. Um, I don't know if I would say they're they're gimmicky, because I think that they naturally fit into like being one of the tools you can use in the hunt. But like I wouldn't I wouldn't call it as gimmicky as the clutch claw, but um, I do think that it got overutilized, especially in Rise. Like Rise just ruined the concept. Right? Rise ruined the concept. Right? Because like my whole thing is that I want. If if some like for a turf to for, force a turf war, sure that's like giving me breathing room. But invaders, right? That's where like you want the invader to be an active threat in your hunt, and they just became a bonus character for extra damage and rise. The opening cinematic for Monster Hunter Three depicts monsters fighting over a potential meal. The figurative player is not involved. Many of the ecology videos showcase a far more believable world than the game offers. I do not think it is unreasonable for the developers at Capcom to restructure their game to allow for these interactions. I understand that the code required to pull this off is quite complex, otherwise it likely would have been added already. The unique interactions depicted in cutscenes throughout the series are an attempt to make up for the fact that developers simply can't make this as believable as they picture it. The cutscenes provide the player an example of what the world could look like if Capcom actually actually did, you know, try to program better interactions between monsters. I'm surprised Capcom- I'm, I'm not going to say the code's not complex. It probably is. They're, 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 they're getting two characters to 
uh, they're getting their AI to realize that they're in a situation and then an animation is triggering and then they have to make sure they're in the right positioning for it so that when the animation triggers, it doesn't like throw someone out of bounds. So like there, there's, there's nuance and complication to the code. Um, I don't necessarily believe um, that it, it, that's the reason that it was never added before necessarily because we have had like, this is the fifth generation of game. I think they were just like looking for new things to like kind of like liven up and liven up the the series at this point, you know. Um, but maybe, maybe it was just too hard. I just I don't believe that's what it was. I don't believe it was too hard. Um, didn't make more of an attempt to make this a real. Like technically, we had like you could almost say that mounting was like as complicated because you had to like. The monster had to thrash around while it, you were mounting it, and they had that stupid, awful mechanic where, like, if you got out of bounds, you like just get knocked off, and it's not your fault, and so you just completely lose that mount for the rest of the hunt. Terrible mechanic. Terrible idea to do it that way. Reality in Monster Hunter World. Let's hope that Monster Hunter Six does better. I consider the Great Jaggers consuming an Aptonoff to be well lazy in comparison to the cutscenes made for the Great Jaggy and the Great Baggy. The interactions between the Alpha and younger bird wyverns depict a social dynamic where they hunt together. In Monster Hunter World, the smaller Jaggers, while they do spend time with the Great Jaggers, they don't actually hunt with the Great Jaggers. This is this is an this is an unfair comparison. This is comparing a a pre-rendered cutscene to in-game mechanics and animations. Again, monsters eating has been around since Monster Hunter One, and Alpha monsters social queuing smaller monsters to attack a prey monster in unison was finally brought into Monster Hunter Rise properly. This is a wonderful inclusion, and it would be great to see this alongside. Yeah, they're different species and there's different strategies. I think you could just like look at the Jagoras thing and make a criticism about it specifically, but I wouldn't compare it to the Jaggy cutscene, you know? Like I, I could look at the ja Jagoras thing and say, oh, that's not as detailed as it could have been, right? You know what I mean? Bye, Pikmin. Bye, Jacob. Thanks for stopping by. Good luck with my video. It's not a disaster. There's, <laughs> it's, it's not a disaster. There's been a lot where I've been like, okay, I agree. Like, there's, there's a lot I agreed with, so don't think it's a disaster, please. Not small monsters. Also, I'm only doing this because I said months ago that I would before we played Dose, so this isn't out of spite or anything. I don't want you to think that. And everybody be nice to Jacob and go watch his videos and check out his Lego Monster Hunter creations. I think, yeah, I think Azuki did it best. Like, see, that's what I'm saying. Look, compare, yeah, compare the Jagras stuff that Jacob's talking about now to the great Izuki, Izuchi, Izuki, Izuchi, where the, the monsters actively coordinate and attack with the greater one, right? Like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's just the lighting, though. It's not, it's not really golden. It's just the lighting. Like everything else if the other interactions were actually present. The cinematics for Monster Hunter 4 showcase the use of items being very deliberate and careful. The hunter characters have to manually carry and place a barrel bomb if they plan to use it. This is seemingly an immersive concept the game could utilize. However, the game would rather prioritize being fast than deliberate. Thus, barrel bombs pop into existence upon being placed. It's been this way since the first game. I'm not saying that the next game needs to have the ability to carry in place barrel bombs like the cinematic, or that the game would be better this way. Rather, I'm stressing that there is a value to this style of game that, that has not been tapped into yet. That a greater focus on immersion could happen if the developers weren't focusing too much on streamlining DPS boss fights. That is completely accurate and fair. That is completely true. I don't think, did I dye my hair? Yes. It's I, I had a blonde a long time ago. Like, if you ever see my avatar, it's when my roots were coming back in and it was blonde on the bottom. And so I just finally dyed it blonde again. Um, I 100% agree with that. I think, like, there is so many things that they could do to slow down the game. I would not suggest barrel bombs being having to be carried over to the monster. That is, That would suck. That would be so annoying. But like you have two choices. You can either streamline the process of hunting the monster so that it's faster and you just do a lot of damage, which is what Rise does and World to some extent, or you can uh, or you can add you can make additional changes to the game that are more slow and deliberate.
and that could though yeah you can add things that make the game more methodical and and they made a conscious decision to stop doing that with world right the games the games slowly got faster from gen one to four for sure but like a lot of the stuff that was added like for hunting and stuff like that i would say is like it was still within a methodical sense and like that was like the the design philosophy and then a lot of that started to get streamlined and sped up in gen 5. in monster Hunter 2 what do you think of the monsters exponentially becoming tankier after every single game but bombs still do the same damage for like 19 years um i think you can utilize bombs in different ways where that negates the problem of bombs like countering bombs and stuff like that so that you do like insane damage um but i mean yeah bombs aren't as cool as they used to be for sure they should probably do more uh consistent hot like higher consistent damage dos the cooking meal system is unique in that all the ingredients must be sourced within the field and be in the player's possession I am, in every yeah. other monster Hunter title the ingredients are always automatically available once the player unlocks them every time the player returns to have a meal those <laughs> ingredients will be present they do have random roles our players should have to wear a back fresh, which agree. affects stamina level but otherwise they are consistent in monster I, I can't talk about the food thing yet because I haven't fully experienced it but I, I think it's a cool change of pace to like make it so that you actually have to provide the ingredients but like because it looks like you eat in your home right yeah I don't know I think I'd have to I have to use it more to decide if it's if it's too obtuse or not to dos the player must select ingredients from what they have in their personal possession in their item box eventually jumbo village does gain a food store that provides most of the ingredients the player would want but perfect. that isn't until well into the game perfect perfect that is exactly how those kind of designs should be happening like that is exactly the kind of design that that's how you do it you make something that is very like slow and methodical and you have to put the effort in to do it at the beginning and then it gets to a point where like they might consider you like kind of tired of that mechanic and they give you they give you the out for that mechanic it's like that's like the farm basically they they kind of just converted that into the farm right like like you oh you're tired of gathering like a bunch of like really mediocre materials here's the farm like use the farm and upgrade and actively upgrade the farm yourself and put work into your farm and it will benefit you in the future hey kitty how's it going those Monhung graphics were such a nice era, 100%, 100%. The PS2 era was like, like I'm the PS2 era's design and like graphics carried over into like Gen 3 and 4 mostly. Definitely some, definitely some changes, but yeah, a great change. Great, great change. There was also no in-game guide or guarantee that any of the food combinations the player selects will actually provide helpful buffs. See, I think I don't like that. I think like if you make a good recipe, um, you should have it written down somewhere. See, that's something I think that that that's a that's a design choice that I don't think they added on purpose. I think they just never thought of adding that system, or they weren't able to add that system at the time, where they would like actively keep track of recipes for you. It is expected to be all from player memory. Furthermore, the meal buffs change depending on the season. Preparing a meal with a spicy ingredient provides positive buffs during the winter, when it is cold. However, during the summer, it provides negative buffs. This is in clear contrast- I figured it out. If 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 Jacob loves that system, perfect game. The, 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 the next true Monster Hunter game after Monster Hunter Dose, Breath of the Wild. Breath of the Wild. You make your food. Sometimes it's garbage. You can eat hot food. You can eat cold food. It's Bre it, Breath of the Wild is Monster Hunter 3, the real Monster Hunter 3. Actually, yeah, Rune Factory is a good example, too. Press the Monster Hunter World, which always provides a well-rounded meal option automatically you down for all the your player, good recipes with for the only positive buffs. Nice. Monster Hunter World prioritizes streamlining systems to make them effortless. Monster Hunter 2 Dos offers a simulator like... It finally clicked with Monster Hunter, or with Breath of the Wild? Nice. I, I played it from start to finish when, when it first came out. I, I bought the Switch day one. Just All I did was play Breath of the Wild. I beat it all. I love that game. Though, I mean, I have my criticisms of it, as I've talked about, but 
system that requires the player to be careful and immerse themselves in understanding how these in-universe meals work. I recently reviewed Monster 1's game box and instruction menu. The instructions place the special emphasis on reward money being as valuable as monster materials. In a world where only the strongest survive, who will deliver the loudest victory cry? It puts special emphasis on survival and understanding monsters. It provides tips on how to track the monster and how to avoid detection. Overall, it asks the player to live in the world first and foremost. In Monster Hunter 1, understanding the world is more important than armor skills or meta endgame weapon configurations. These things didn't exist on the same level they do now. I discussed this in part 6 in great detail. Monster Hunter 2 DOS took these concepts and buckled down on them. The overall hunting simulation lends itself better when the player is fully immersed. By forcing the player to memorize the schedules that the quests and gatherable items are on, they can perform better in the hunting of the monsters. Creating immersion for the player is extremely difficult to pull off. It's also difficult to simply tell the player to immerse themselves if they simply do not want to. I commend Monster Hunter 2 DOS for trying, and I don't blame anyone who plays this game to literally not care and give up because it's all too complicated. In my opinion, it is a shame that these new features in Monster Hunter 2 DOS were abandoned instead of being improved. Monster Hunter World... It's, it, it's nice to say, like, it's hard to say if this is for sure because, like, I've been playing the game for, like, ever, but I don't think the mechanics of DOS are, like, really complicated. I th like I think one of the benefits of Monster Hunter is that, like, originally it was so simplistic that, like, the real complication was, like, why am I still getting my ass kicked in this very simple game, you know? And then you just had to, like, find the nuances under that. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, Huevos. I don't know if I said that right. Huevos? Huevos? But you know what I mean? Like, I, I, if you want to, if you want to, you know, I'm playing Armored Core 3 on PS2 right now, man. That's a, that's a complicated game. That's a, that's a, that's a complicated game. Monster Hunter Dose is like a breath of fresh air in comparison to that game. There's so much potential to bring these concepts back for its living, breathing world that it advertises. I'm going to provide an example of a theoretical subjective experience I had. Oh, I didn't, I didn't tell Jacob to turn off the 16 by 9 I meant to roast him so hard for that. I meant to roast him for that. Damn it. I'm playing Monster 2 Dos, and another one from Monster Hunter World. Slaying a Pink Rathian in Monster Hunter 2 Dos. Well, the Pink Rathian is only available during the winter and breeding seasons, so I prepared myself in the summer season by stockpiling the items needed for potions and mega potions during the day. Okay. During the night, I stockpile Medikit. flash bugs for flash bombs. Oh, that's the old Once patch. it's the winter season, I eat a meal that I've memorized that will give me a positive buff. <laughs> Wait I a second, what was that in his inventory? Women barbecue space. <laughs> what the fuck? Oh my god. That dot hack infection is not complicated, uh, but you're not dumb. It's just it's not a very good game. Like I love dot hack, but like it's not it's not very good in terms of the battle system. You really just have to learn to spam your menu and spam skills and and use a fuck ton of buffs, and then you just win. Women barbecue spit and wetter, bro. Oh my lord. Eat a meal that I've memorized that will give. Oh, me it's a the old it's the old English patch. So yeah, I it's then definitely a mistranslation. I have to remember where the pink Rathian spawns, and if I don't make it oh, in time to that zone, it really is I have to just memorize where the pink spot, Rathian okay. will likely go. Otherwise, I could try and attract her by playing a flute. Once I've finally found her, the fight begins. And now to compare. Slaying a pink Rathian in Monster Hunter World Iceborne. The quest to fight a pink Rathian is always available. I already have 1000 mega potions on standby given to me through a free minigame. Flash bombs are given to me in the hundreds by this guy with very little consequence. The game provides a meal selection for me that already has decent buffs. Once I embark on the quest, the scout flies automatically guide me to the monster. Then the fight begins. These are very different experiences, and obviously the player could theoretically stockpile a thousand mega potions in Monster 2 Dos, however the process would probably take at least a thousand gathering quests in the jungle. I'm glad he said that because, like, I was going to say, like, you know, you could just prepare for a lot of stuff early on in the game and then you'll be good for a long period of time. Like, that's how I play. Um, and, yeah, he showed the arena there, so not the best example, but he is right. The scout flies will eventually just guide you to everything. Um, 
but you do need to put in the effort to get the scout flies to that level. That's the one credit I give scout flies is that they don't work immediately and you have to put the effort in to get them to work. And um, there's something else I was going to say. I don't remember. I, I think he's overemphasizing. Like, like the, obviously, I agree. Obviously, I agree that there is more preparation that goes into the old games than there is in the newer games. Um, so I, I guess I don't think he's overemphasizing. I, I agree with him. There is there is more preparation that goes into the old games than the new games. And would fill up an entire page of items in the player's item box. Bryce has GPS. Which, it does. as we know, it does is valuable space. Likewise, the player could theoretically simply Bryce not did do it the, the worst, game in Monster the World Iceborne and gather a thousand mega potions via the environment. However, in man. both cases, this is not ideal and would take forever. Ideally, the player will play the best that they can for what they need to succeed, and in both cases, the game is balanced accordingly. Monster 2 Dos expects the player to likely be running low on potions. Monster World expects- What's the science behind Psycho Serum? People literally have psychic powers and you in magic in this world, and you drink Psycho Serums to bring out your magical powers. ...expects the player to have an endless supply. The difference is how the game grants the player mega potions. One is an immersive experience that teaches the player to live off the land. The other is menu navigation that teaches the player to play a minigame. Simply saying that one is better than the other is difficult. Simply saying that the minigame is more fun than gathering from the environment is a subjective argument and thus holds no weight. If the game did yes. not provide a player a faster alternative for acquiring items in the endgame, players would simply learn to work without them, or continue to use the original method of gathering. In it's yeah, because like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say that gathering like I like gathering, but there definitely comes a point where I've been gathering for so long that I don't want to gather that much anymore, and that's why games past two, but before five, have these like m like midpoints or whatever you want to call them, like um, what's it called? Uh, compromises, like the farm and stuff like that. Like the game, the game, I, the developers at some point, like this, this is the conversation they had. They go, man, you know what I just realized? We need a, a ton of honey in this game. Like we need more honey than is like worthwhile gathering. Like, like the amount of time we need to put into gathering honey takes up so much of the game because we need mega potions and we should find a way to facilitate making that a little bit easier so that more of the game is about monster hunting you know we want to find a good balance between monster hunting and living off the land and we need to we need to add something in between that makes it a little bit easier for them but we still want them to put the effort in to maximize their gains and i don't obviously i don't think this was the way to do it uh you you just don't worry about items in world like items are not a thing to worry about at all in this game in my opinion, I believe that offering a faster alternative like this minigame overall hinders the game experience and causes it to focus on DPS boss fights over everything else, which is <laughs> how many my times does he thesis. say DPS boss fights? Aside from speedrunners, like average wrong, players really. are required to bring potions and mega potions to make up for any mistakes they make during battle. Monster 2 Dos wants the player to be conscious about their supply. Monster 2 Dos hinders the player from repeating quests via limiting the player's access to items and limiting the access to the quest itself through the season and time of day systems. Monster Hunter 2 Dos ultimately denies the player the ability to grind the same quests and monsters. Monster Hunter Portable games created the modern grind as we know it today. If the player desires specific equipment or to raise their hunter rank, they are required to repeat the same quests over and over, hunting the same monster repeatedly. Monster Hunter World doesn't want the player to be conscious about their supply. Monster Hunter Portable games only want the player to be conscious about the DPS boss fights, performing well against these formidable monsters. The game is called Monster Hunter. It's not called Monster Survival Simulator. It's called Monster Hunter. I, I just talked about how the game wants to facilitate, uh, it wants you to have aspects of gathering and development and preparation, but those aspects of developing and gathering and preparation shouldn't be so overbearing that they take away from the main point of the game, which is the game's title, monster hunter because like at the end of the day even though i do agree that like there has become 
too much of a focus on just rushing into a fight and killing it as fast as possible with insane moves and abilities where you just completely overpower the monster, the game is still focused on getting you out there to hunt the monster because it's Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter. Well, what? Frankie just ran in here. What the fuck? It's not just it's not just DPS but I agree with DPS boss fights. It's the argument he's making that is just I don't agree with. You can't look at Monster Hunter Portable and call that like the the boss rush simulator. You can't you can't say that about Portable. If you if if any of you have played through Freedom Unite, you know that isn't true. You know how much effort needs to go into like not just getting the gear and stuff like that, but like getting your farm upgraded so that it's actually useful, getting the stuff you need to make items, getting the equipment you need, like getting the items through grinding those hunts to get the stuff you need so that you can do that one hunt that's kicking your fucking ass. It, like at some point, like I, I could not look at Monster Hunter Freedom Unite and be like, yeah, this is just, this game's too much about like going in there and just dealing as much damage as fast as possible to the monster. Fights in Unite are terrifying. Have you ever fought or did, have you ever done the dual Rajang key quest in Hub by yourself? That quest is that quest is terrifying. That quest sucks. You have to be prepared for that shit. Yeah, there's a key double Tigrex quest. These games do not want the player to have to worry about. Oh, there's a there's a there's a Tigrex quest and there's a double Rajang quest you have to do. You fight the double Rajang in an arena. Oh, is it optional? Well, I mean, I did it. I did it because I had to get the um, the Copper Blanganga Longsword upgrade because it was OP. About their supply levels so that they can continue the grind. These games allow the player to repeat these quests as fast as possible. Gathering in 5th generation Monster Hunter is now the fastest it's ever been. But wow, is this the super rad lemon of the YouTube channel Super Rad known for such videos as the uncomfortable truth about the handler, the Fallout New Vegas retrospective and the yet to be released Oblivion retrospective? Yes. Super odd rogger slide super odd rogger slide super odd rog Thank you generic. Collecting herbs instantly creates a potion and gathering honey instantly combines with the potion into a mega potion. This would have been wonderful in Monster Hunter Dos, where I have to do it manually in a menu. However, despite this wonderful improvement to the gathering system, it is a quality of life change that is a decade late. Monster Hunter Portable games already normalized using a farm system to obtain mega potions without requiring any gathering whatsoever. You're it's more efficient to simply use the- He was gathering right there! He's a liar! I'm done the video, that's it. Proven liar. Proven liar. Rise. So why would the player even need to go out to gather on the map? Ultimately, we are still back to combining items and menus, just like Monster 2 DOS. The farm system itself is a whole subject that requires its own section to follow this. But to briefly- Oh, uh, you know where you can learn a lot about the the farm and how it works and stuff? There's, this, there's like this crazy Freedom Unite retrospective on YouTube. You guys should check it out. It's crazy. Segue. Farming has also lost all importance and has been boiled down to just menu navigation that Monster Hunter World and Rise have barely attempted to improve. When mainline will get us the hunt when mainline will get us the hunter charm? What do you mean? What are you saying? Oh, we're in part four. All right, this section. The introduction and swift decline of the farm system. Oh, he is, he's doing a section on the farm system. Holy shit. It's actually pretty short. And just if, he, if he doesn't like the farm system. Look, I have my own issues with the farm system. We'll see if they align. I'm going to be talking about how the farm system has basically evolved uh, throughout the Monster Hunter. You should check out the Super Red YouTube channel. I'm pretty sure it's there. I don't know, though. It's an item in Frontier that mixed with talents and charms into just one item. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that. I think I actually have it in the Rain private server. The farm was introduced in Monster Hunter Portable. It is a small section attached to they Kotoko Village. I uh, is, that, is that how you pronounce it? Kotoko? It gives the player the option to use a single gathered item, such as a herb or power seed, and plant it. 
The planted item would then grow and multiply after a quest. Yes. For example, by planting one herb, the player will have five after completing a quest. There is a mushroom box that the player can gather mushrooms at. There's also fishing spots, mining spots, and bug catching spots that are also free to use without the need of consumables like pickaxes or bug nets. The philosophy behind the farm was to let the player focus more- You don't have to use dung, like, and there's multiple different types of fertilizers, but the fertilizers do help uh, up the amount of stuff you'll get. Fertilizers carried over into like Monster Hunter 3 as well. Or on the hunts, since it was a PlayStation portable title, and they would ideally be playing it on the go. I th honestly, it's like hilariously, even though it's almost the same system, I still think that 4 Ultimate did it the worst. Because you're just doing like this trading thing, and you upgrade it through using it a lot. Even if I don't need the items, I now have to farm for the items that I don't need to upgrade the, th the trade mechanic so that I can get more things. Like, it it's just dumb. The farm requires leveling up through collecting account items and racking in the Yeah, the giant points. Aptanoth. I think it you have to do that and try to. In my opinion, I find this to be a suitable reward dumb. for the player's time and dedication to the game. The player must still manually collect every mushroom and mine and catch bugs. Yeah, it's like like at least like as as much as like three ultimate simplified it and like I mean I'll take and leave that. Uh, at least they showed you the dude's farming and they you actively saw your farm improve instead of just having the the what's it called the Wycoon, I think. It's the same activity as being out on the hunting How'd you map. Get in here? It simply has the convenience of being next to the player house and does not require an active quest as well as there's no enemy monsters attacking you. Portable 2nd and 2nd G expanded on the farm, bringing back all the features and adding a couple new ones. Portable 3rd also uses the exact same farm system. It is earned through deliberate work and patience. It still requires the same energy that's needed out in the field, but acts as a convenient reward to the player. If the pl the G one's the same as the 4 you one, basically, except you can technically go to a farm if you want to. It's, it's not good. player fails a quest, they can at least expect to have a honey box with five honey waiting for them. The player was never completely out of mega potions, and they could keep the hunt going. It's through the portable games that the focus on the hunt became increasingly more important than the game. I get why they did it in 4 I call Don't Monster 2 Dose the last survival and simulator-focused game in the franchise, partially because it was the last game without a farm system. The player is required to manually gather the materials needed to make potions and other consumables regularly. Every quest requires the player to gather materials and combine potions and cook steaks. It's why the game gives the player 15 minutes to complete the quest. I've been over this. The player has limited item space, so they have to decide between items like honey or a Rathian shell, as I've said before. The player must think critically, because... Every I have to do this stuff in every Monster Hunter game, man. Like, this is not a Doge-specific thing. I don't agree with this point at all. I In every fucking Monster Hunter game, I have always been in that situation where I run out of space, and I'm just pissed off because I have to figure out what I'm getting rid of and what I'm keeping. Like... Again, the farm is just like a, a compromise that had to be made because gathering in these games takes too long. Like, it is too long. You're asking too much of the player when the focus of your game is, in fact, hunting the monsters. Everything is critical. The player must dedicate time to prepare their hunter adequately for the big hunt. That means sacrificing the chance to hunt a monster that's only available during the summer season because the need to stockpile on honey and other items for the hunt takes precedence. Again, he's again he's putting too much emphasis on the season system and it's limiting it limiting your selection because like I know he's saving up for the twenty one thousand four hundred Zenny Babel gun lance here or or normal lance sorry, uh, but he he can he can cut eight hundred Zenny and and go, you know. Go take a big sleep and change the season. As I've said before, certain monsters are only available during certain seasons. For the Gravios hunt, I was given a choice to hunt the monster on the last day of winter with limited supplies, or wait a whole in-game year to hunt with a fully replenished- You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You had to wait a full in-game year, so we're on, uh... That's 3200 Zenny. You can make that super fast. The gathering quest alone, the one gathering quest in the game, if you do everything in it, which doesn't take that long, makes you 900 zenny. You, that means you only have to do it four times. You get uh, you get gathering items during the process. If you want, you don't have to worry about that. And you're good. 
Yeah, and you can sell the Kutku scales because they're decent. Just sell your items. Like, your items start to make a lot of money. Stock. That's hours of preparation. Of course, as... Yeah, if, if skipping seasons was actually difficult, then there would be something that he would be saying something here. But because they're not difficult to skip, it's just like a, it's a fake argument. The player approaches the end game. Obviously, the shops will begin to sell consumables like potions. But as I've mentioned in part two, money is scarce in this game. The best means to get money. Wait, are there combo books in this game? Is to hunt dangerous monsters and sell the rewards. Monster 2 Dos treats monster hunting like it's a job, because it is. It's a hunting simulation game. In Monster World Iceborne, as I've said before, the game gives you free mega potions through the Steam minigame. In Monster Hunter 3, Jacob the farm system me? was boiled Did down just to give one gathered consumable of any kind, and it'll be multiplied automatically every quest up to 10 times. If the player gives one honey, then return to the farm after 10 quests. Do you still need quests. the combo books in your inventory to make to 40 them honey. It work, or can they this be in your box? This is extremely helpful for the end game. It requires resource points, a similar point system in the portable games, to do this. And you uh. can either gain them through free hunting for the village, or trading specific commodities. Again, in my subjective opinion, I believe this is fairly balanced, and also a neat concept. It yeah, I agree, it's balanced, because like you're not... You're still actively gathering from time to time in order to get certain materials, and you don't get to use the farm for free because you actually have to spend points on things, and so you still have to do stuff to get those points, and one of the main ways to get those points is to hunt monsters that you normally wouldn't be hunting because you're, you're stuck on the forecast system, so you're going to be f hunting random things in Moga Woods, so it's like it's like almost the perfect balance requires the player to be the village hunter, and the game rewards the player based on what monsters they hunt for the village. The player gets special unique- I said this in the retrospective, but like my perfect farm is the concept that they had, like st certain stuff might cost money or so like resource points or something, like in three ultimate, but you get the full Freedom Unite farm. However, instead of having to go to the farm after every quest so that you don't miss out on items, they instead build up to a cap and then you can wait till that cap in order to go get everything or you can get everything early. That's how the farm should work. Commodities that can be traded for special items and the village farm gives the player the consumables required to perform well in hunts. It plays into the simulation aspect of the Monster Hunter franchise. In many ways, it can be argued that Monster Hunter 3 Try is more Monster Hunter rather than Monster Hunter Portable. The game pushes the player to actually hunt and gather for their village Rewarding Wait, so three the player for partaking not Monster in the Hunter Portable? I'm not surprised that this system was not normalized going forward. The Monster Hunter Portable philosophy of prioritizing the grind of DPS boss fights goes against the slower, the system was utilized immersive moving forward. experience what does he mean? of the Monster Hunter philosophy. It was used all the, the way Monster up to Hunter GU. Monster farm system was normalized by every title to follow. Not entirely sure how it oh. works in Monster Hunter 4 on the lore side of things, but this buddy guy takes the player's items and multiplies them. He's Though, trading. unlike Monster Hunter 3, the points required to do the item multiplication are far more common. Every time I've played Monster Hunter 4, I rack up so many points unknowingly that I'm- This is not a fair comparison. This is not a fair comparison because you're probably doing- You're doing a ton of requests at first, and requests- The initial time you do requests, you get resource points the first time, but not afterwards. And then I don't know how you would get other resource points after that. I'm pretty sure you have to go into expeditions and get points. You know? Like, I'm pretty sure that's how it works. I am broke in this fucking game. When we soloed this, I was broke. But I didn't take part in the, in the expeditions in the solo run. The lemon in my name is just... Uh, it, it's a long story. Basically, like, I had a... I had a different name in like a Star Wars role playing like D and D tabletop thing. I had a character named Yen Ben because it sounded Star Warsy, but Yen Ben's a type of lemon. So never required to seek them out. You're lying, Same Jacob. You're Hunter lying. Cross. It gives the player so many that it is a non-issue. And the player can do item multiplication without delay. Noise. Funny enough, in Monster Hunter World, the player will gain resource points just by looking at the monster. The farm system continues to remain as it yeah, was Yeah, I mean, in that's World, though. World just... The player is given the option to multiply items. It's not exactly necessary anyway, since collection of items are not restricted, and you can also just trade materials to get them. 
the player can easily receive the ingredients to craft Mega Potions quite quickly. See me, In Monster 2 Dulse, Mega Potions require herbs that can only be by. found during the day, and honey that can only be found during the summer and breeding season. In Monster World, the player is also given the option to trade bones or other materials for Mega Potions with the Elder Melder. I'm honestly surprised the game doesn't just hand them over for free. Oh wait, it does, through the Steam minigame. Technically not for free, but yes. I was prioritizing yes, the I style agree. of game design to I agree. speedrunners, but speedrunners don't need potions. <laughs> Their goal is to never make a mistake. Rather, this game design seems to be catered towards prioritizing the combat above all else. Is this bad game design? No, it's fine. I like the combat in Monster Hunter like everyone else. This is what separates a Monster Hunter game from a Monster Hunter portable game. Bro, no, it's not. Goes as much faster in Monster no, it's World, not. As I've said, it's instantaneous. You can't look at fucking Rise and World and be like, mm, "This is what a Monster Hunter portable Blue game is." And every, and only dose in World anymore. Or only dose in Monster Hunter One or with all the other options to get Monster Hunter potions, like, gathering on, consumables man. has become trivial and unnecessary. At, like, the, the whole thing seems trivial and unnecessary, in my opinion. I can understand the developer's intentions. The ability to create potions on the field was in Monster 2 Dulce and was a viable strategy. Yeah, fuck strategy. Spirit Birds, man. It would keep the fight Such going if the player is running out of supplies. You think Jacob would like Spirit However, Birds because they incentivize exploring the map before the you actually take part in the hunt. However, this is nullified by the fact that the player can simply return to the base camp tent and access their entire D supply of thousands of potions. Is this bad game design? No. It's just catered towards prioritizing the combat above all else. Though I do believe the importance of gathering has been completely lost, I believe a balance between these two Didn't concepts could that? create a very fresh and exciting experience. Wait, what happened? Oh. Damn, he's spitting with that title. Everything up to this point is evidence and context to my thesis that the Monster Hunter franchise- I think my main issue is that like a lot of what he says, I'm like, initially I'm like, yeah, you're right. World and Rise are kind of like that. I agree. And then he like says that the thing he's talking about is for like try onward or maybe not try onward, but like, I think try technically though. He said he didn't know where he put it, but you know what I mean? Like for onward, he's like, is like that, but it's not. It's only like the worst examples of this the most prevalent examples of this are World and Rise. It started as a fantasy hunting survival simulator DPS action multiplayer series, but has been transformed into a fantasy hunting action multiplayer series. So basically, the survival simulator aspects have been removed. Quests already begin with supplying the player a limited number of consumables. I fear that eventually the game will normalize fully stocking the player every time, and it'll be considered a quality of life change. All in the effort to prioritize the combat they, above all else. They might do that. This is great if you like combat. And don't get me wrong, I like the combat in Monster, Monster Hunter. Hunter has always been fantasy. It's yes. a huge part Did of the game's otherwise? appeal. It's unfortunate if you're like me and you like the simulator and survival aspects, because they're being actively if you're like me no, and I think you, you like always the simulator and survival aspects. Because they are being actively gutted from the franchise. For Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate, the developers decided to bring back the old desert map. The map from Monster Hunter 1. It even has the original music and the monsters. Unfortunately, what they didn't bring back was the actual map itself. It barely resembles the original on an aesthetic level, and the individual zones are cluttered with ledges to allow the player easier access to mount monsters. And I get it, this makes sense on a gameplay level. It would be smart to modify the map so it suits the new feature of mounting. Okay. It's unfortunate that this change came at the cost of losing what made the original map unique. Ah, yes. The uniqueness of dunes. I forgot how much character... <laughs> I forgot how much character and detail was in this flat map of nothing. <laughs> we didn't even lose the palm trees. They're still in the game. Like, literally only, like, adding ledges was the main complaint. And if anything, that, like, adding ledges adds to the character of the map. And obviously they were necessary. It was a large open desert. Wow. Now it's a small arena. This is aesthetics, and we can't objectively quantify one is better than the other. However, I can reasonably... No, I'm objectively quantifying one is better than the other. I am objectively quantifying the MH4U Dunes map as being better than 
the MH1 Dunes map, specifically because Jacob calls it an open desert, and then he points to this section of the map, seven, the largest area of the fucking game, or of the map, that is an open desert. It's an open desert. It has like two ledges and a pillar in the middle. And then when the pillar gets destroyed, it makes a sand trap. That's sick. Literally, it's literally just dunes with better shit. Objectively. 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 State that the smaller zones make traversal faster. I believe they scale down the zone size to reduce game time. Again, this is the developers wanting to prioritize combat above the simulation. While I argue that it's- No, nah, man, like you are not showing yourself fighting Cephalos while talking about this. No way. One of the worst things to deal with is a Cephalos or a Cephadrome. That is just not a fun monster to fight. More immersive to have the player travel across a massive desert plain. It's much less combat friendly, and I understand that. Show me the gut. Show me the fucking dunes map. Let's let me see this shit. Hold on. Pissing me off. Pissing me off. Dunes MH1 map. That's for ultimate. No, that's generation. Generations works though. Okay, that's generations. Sorry, I'm pulling it up here. You guys can't see it. I'm just trying to. I'm trying to find the MH1 map. Anybody have the MH1 map? Dunes Monster Hunter One PS2 image. I can't find it. Yo, what's up? What's up, Adam? It, it's not actually this. I know it looks super gold. It's not this color. It's actually just kind of blonde. The, my lighting in here is like super warm. MHFU Old Desert. Thank you. Okay. That's a custom map. I just want like the main map. Bro, I'm going full Super Saiyan. I'm going to get that Victory Royale in Fortnite. Just wait, man. It's going to be crazy. Okay. I would say areas 7 and 2 are, are unarguably bigger. You could make the argument for 7. You could make the argument for 7 that they're the same size. 2 is obviously bigger. 2 is obviously bigger. What do you mean, fuck off? What the hell? Why are you being rude to me? It's because I play Fortnite. I drink cola. Now I got like the reverse frosted tips because like my ends are still kind of dark. So it's like the other other spectrum. When are they adding Monster Hunter to Fortnite? I, I'm, I've been saying, I've been saying, when are they doing that? I'm ready. I'm ready for that. How did this get all the way down there? My tape on my, I need a new headphone cord at some point. Yeah, like, I really think you need to consider, like, if we're talking about the village experience and we're talking about hunting certain monsters in this game, there is there is nothing less fun than chasing a monster around this giant fucking desert when you're, like, a, when you're like a Lance player or something. Like, could you imagine? Could you imagine? That's, 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 he that's bowgun privilege. It's bowgun privilege. The last true desert plain we saw in a desert themed map was in the sandy plains in Monster Hunter 3 Tri. Monster Hunter World saw no effort to bring back a large desert plain with a wild spire waste. Again, and another reason that Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate is the GOAT. Another reason that this game is the GOAT. Has big open deserts. That's what Jacob wants, he got it. Again, it was less of a desert Goated and more game. of a cluttered gorge. And, and I get it, it benefited vertical- Also, all the monsters look better in- Three ultimate. Their textures are like goaded. Combat to be designed this way. There are other maps I could attempt to argue also share this design philosophy, such as comparing the forest in Monster Hunter World to the forest in Monster Hunter One. But I worry that the evidence is just it just isn't strong enough for this video. Thankfully, Monster Hunter Rise brought back the sandy plains, and it's exactly the same as it was in Monster Hunter Three Try. Is he joking? Is he about to make a joke? Just bigger, more.
what? I think, I think, can you see my mouse? I think he just means like the two top parts right behind my webcam. I think like the only part that I really consider the same is like this 10 and nine, 10 and nine. Like that's it. ...to explore. This is nostalgically satisfying for veterans of the series such as myself. Monster Rise's maps are very large, open areas where the player is free to traverse. These new maps feel like a true return to form for the franchise. I worry that in Monster Hunter 6, they will attempt to add a replacement for the Wirebug and Palamute to keep the player traversal speed high. I yeah. specifically play Monster Hunter Rise without a Palamute to slow myself down. Okay, I don't the current Monster Hunter Direction is pushing for faster and faster gameplay to ensure to the him. player can get to the DPS boss fight as fast as possible. The game does not offer an experience where the player gets lost and immersed in these rather beautiful environments like Monster Hunter 1 and 2 did. Despite the return of the sandy plains in Monster Hunter Rise, they have not brought back the changing temperature system of the desert that was in Monster Hunter 3 Tri. True. Similarly to Monster Hunter 2 Ghost, the desert would have different temperatures depending on the time of He's day. He's spitting right now. During the day, the desert plains are hot and require a cold drink. During the night, it is cold and the player must drink a hot drink. The changing temperatures can be argued as being part of an immersive experience, but more importantly, they were an extra challenge for the player. Yes. albeit a minor one. The game yes. simply expects the player to consume them, a specific Jacob. item in order to cancel the negative effects of a the temperature. A, a, I understand a, a the arguments to state that this is a positive change. The drinks made, take up a valuable item spot for that other mechanic. items in the player's item house. The player is forced to consume the them the every 10, 5 to 10 minutes Objectively in order to cancel the effects. It, it does seem arbitrary, I get it. This plays into Capcom's focus on prioritizing DPS boss fights over stop, a survival stop simulator. It. Stop saying it. Stop saying it, Jacob. Come on, man. Come on. Stop saying DPS boss fights. Game. If Monster Hunter was still advertised as a survival game, it would be expected the player would acknowledge survival prioritization. Yeah, technically, as two they cats would in a can just be better. Scenario. I don't if like using Palamutes, but they're the a snow, Perhaps they should protect themselves from the cold. Capcom removes the feature entirely instead of improving or fixing it. Yeah. This is a trend. Yeah. Refining the temperature system to be tied Yo, to the player spitting right armor now. is Let's a go. decent solution. Every armor piece has a temperature rating, and the player is expected to equip specific equipment for the locale they are fighting in. If the player would rather prioritize an armor set that has a bad... I mean, you could do it that way, or you could, like, use the new armor skill system and just have varying levels of, like, hot and cold temperature regulation temperature rating for the locale they're hunting in they could either eat a meal or it's not a survival game i wouldn't call monster hunter a survival simulator by any means but it's, it's also not supposed to be like a full arcadey like monster dps boss fight simulator either you know or use a consumable item like the original hot and cold drinks this is all just an idea no monster hunter game has ever implemented this Either way, Monster Hunter Rise set another precedent that the mm. series would rather prioritize the DPS boss fight Ugh. in any way they can by removing more preparation and deliberate action taken by the player before embarking on the quest. Yes. In Monster Hunter World, they added a small arena that gives the player the option to fight any monster within. These tend to be the go-to for speedrunners. Makes sense, it's small and easy to work with, it's more predictable. For non-speedrunners, it's a simple location that makes farming monster materials slightly faster. Again, prioritizing fighting large monsters. Bro, like, sure, yeah, yeah, they give you the option. They have arenas, and not that arenas give you the points, like, not, not that arenas give you monster parts in the old games, but, like, they have arenas. If all, if all we cared about was the boss fighting simulation, this perfect example, if all we cared about was boss fighting simulators, all we would run is the arena in in the monster hunter games we would only run the dose arena we like like that would be the main core game that's a boss fight simulator because these games have so much shit in between they are they are not boss fight simulators you know what i mean monsters monster hunter portable games focuses on a grind where it expects the player to hunt the same monster repeatedly as fast as possible to ensure the player receives large monster materials as fast as possible monster hunter portable games thus put more value on large monster materials such as i don't know a raffalos plate rather than gathered item consumables like for example a Do you get the monster hunter game puts more value on a raffalos plate than a stack of 10 honey that's crazy 
a dragon toadstool. That's crazy. Monster two dose, the dragon toadstool has more value than most monster carbs. That's weird. That's weird, bro. What monster carbs are we looking at? Many of the large monsters actually share the monster materials of their small monster counterparts. I mentioned this in part two. Show me a, show me a monster, a large monster specific rare piece. Show me a, show me a Rathalos plate and tell me if it is more or less expensive than than a, a dragon toadstool, please. Hunting a Velocidrome will result in mostly Velociprey materials. Hunting a Kongalala will result in mostly Konga materials. By ca that was, I, to be fair, we only did Bulldrome, but that was not my experience. I know you can get Bullfango materials from Bulldrome, but apparently, you, I think Amy said you had to capture it. And carving it, you got, I only got Bulldrome materials. Capturing the monster, the player has a higher chance of getting the specific large monster so not materials the case, for that large think. monster. The game is balanced, it's, expecting the player to not always capture the monster. So these specific rewards are considered rare drops. Monster materials aren't always exclusive to carving the monster. The player can receive cutku scales from gathering at a yeah, and cut coo. Yeah, okay, that's right. Honey hive during the breeding season. The player can also receive Cachella Diora scales from mining at the tower. The player can access weapons and armor without actually slaying these large monsters. Th can you fully make a Kushala piece of equipment? just based off of getting the materials that you need from mining? Is that possible? Is that what he's saying? He can't be, does he just mean that you can see them? The large monsters simply offer more rewards and a rare chance of one or two specific carbs. Furthermore, more materials are shared no, between this similar is, this monsters. Is, this is a Blows, crazy fangs argument. Blows are received this from Diablos, crazy. Black Diablos, Monoblos, and White Monoblos. The Piscine Fang drops are also shared between all Piscine Wyverns, including the small Cephalos. Both Lunastra and Teostra share the same scale material, known as Fire Dragon Scales. They are the same animal, so it is completely understandable that the material would be sh I do see a point that he is making is that you can... King, thank you. Eight months, let's go. I, I can at the very least say that I think it is a nice feature. Hi, great, thank you for the follow. I think it's a nice feature that some of the monsters that you'll be fighting have overlapping materials because this is a game that tries to limit what you have the ability to hunt. Therefore, you have more options to get the thing that you need, even if it's like not a specific season or something like that. I think that's a cool mechanic. Shared in Monster World, while the Teostra drops Fire Dragon scales, just like the old games, Lunastra drops Lunastra scales. Monster World actively goes out of its way to prevent monsters from sharing materials. Without need to micromanage the player's inventory, they can add an endless number of arbitrary new monster material drops. Yes. In order to guarantee the player faces every monster, it creates separate drops right, for gotta... every monster that is not... Sh Jacob, change the costume, man. Change the costume. It's not a good costume. It's not a good costume. It's... it's... I don't know. It's gross. Shared between Not a big monsters. Fan. Monster Under Portable <sighs> Games prioritize each monster are, as the, the new middle. and next formidable challenge. Almost. The game progresses through a series of DPS boss fights. If there were workarounds and receiving materials through the other sources, the player would simply use the workarounds. Hey, the workarounds were placed in Monster Under 2 DOS deliberately. Kutku scales sell for a lot of money. Same with the Cachella Diora scales. The large monster fights in Monster 2 Dos are far more difficult than the current games. The game doesn't want to punish the player by having the awful RNG prevent them from getting one extra Teostra scale. The player can fight the easier Lunastra. I, I don't think that's what they're going for with this. I don't think they're trying to... Thank you, Code Monkey. I don't think they're trying to... Um... Make sure you don't get punished. Again, this is this is from the perspective that of like only single player. Draw instead and still gain the same reward. In Monster 2 DOS, the value of small monster materials are similar to the value of large monster materials. Slaying small monsters is just as important as Can can someone can someone confirm that please? Is is like a even just Bulldrome and Bullfango Hide, I guess. Like, like I'd like to know what the difference between Bulldrome and Bullfango Hide is, price-wise, if you sold it. And I'd like to know what the difference between, like, 
Rathian scales, and that is... Slaying large monsters, just as it is important to gather materials. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Monster 2 DOS is a very different game with a different... Like, I don't even understand the point he's making, because like he's like, oh, you know, the game facilitated ways for you to get the other items that you need so that if the large monster doesn't give it to you, um, you can get it from somewhere else. You're fighting Kushala. Does Kushala sh share certain things with other monsters? Like, like maybe like talons or something? Because like, sure, it's nice that you could potentially go mine a scale of Kushala if you're missing like a scale or two, like that's cool. You know, I don't know. It's just, this is this this whole section so far has just been like a very weird like fever dream of shit. Elder Dragon Blood's always been split between all of them. That's still a thing. I can't imagine making the argument that like monsters having unique materials is a, is a detriment. Design philosophy. Going on a hunting quest involves more than taking down one large monster. It involves a number of activities. It's a simulator game. He's... <laughs> Not every weapon and piece of armor you make that is like Rathian specific is going to need purely Rathian materials. Sometimes you need ore. Sometimes you need other obtuse items. Sometimes, you know, sharp claws, piscine fangs, stuff like that. El large elder dragon blood. Bugs, exactly. Like not everything in these games you get from hunting the monster. That is one. That is just the major aspect of every Monster Hunter game because it's called Monster Hunter because you're supposed to be hunting monsters. At some point, the developers decided that hunting and carving large monsters was the most fun aspect of the game. It is the most fun. What? What? You know, at some point down the line of Monster Hunter, they decided that hunting the monster was the most fun aspect of the game. I'm I'm sure Jacob I'm sure that was just like a I'm sure he doesn't feel that way anymore because that's 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 that that is the most in like the silliest misstep of a of a comment I could I could ever make. You know like I'm like he can't still believe that. Rather than adjusting and balancing small monsters to be equal. Yes. Yes. Hunting small monsters has never been fun. No one plays the game to hunt the small monsters. They play it to hunt the big monsters. Which is why Monster Hunter World rarely requires the player to fight any small monsters at all. Monster 2 DOS's tradition of providing small monster drops from large monsters actually did continue in the fourth generation. The material drop tables, while more generous, are essentially the same. When comparing a Velocidrum's materials between Monster Hunter 2 DOS and Monster Hunter 4, the player can still gain Velocipri scales from carving. The player can still gain Kutku scales from a honey hive gathering spot. Monster World was the first to completely drop this. The Great Jagras shares no materials with a regular young Jagras, as I've said before. In Monster World, it is impossible to gain a large monster material from passive gathering on the map. In Monster World and Rise, the useful materials are only obtainable from large monster fights. The developers have made the large monster fights the focus. Every game in this series, every game in this series makes large monster fights the focus. Every game in this series makes large monster fights the focus. Everything else in the game is to facilitate you hunting monsters because it has always been the focus. 
there are less interruptions between the player and the monster. With tighter monster hitboxes, the player can hit the monster more and not be punished for standing too close. Players are rewarded for He didn't say that. That's fucked. <sighs> oh my god. I think I think that's like a notorious one. I think I think Jacob knows that's like that's just silly. He said like he said like um I'll just replay it. Focus. There are less interruptions between the player and the monster. There are less interruptions between the player and the monster. Why is that, Jacob? Monster. With tighter monster hitboxes, the player can hit the monster more and not be punished for standing too close. Players. I'm gonna let you guys sit with that. I'm going to the bathroom. Present day. Present time. <laughs> and you don't seem to understand A shame you seemed an honest man And all the fears you hold so dear Will turn to whisper in your ear And you know what the same might hurt you And you know that it makes so much back where were we oh yeah all right i i will never believe that uh the hitboxes oh actually you know what i just realized maybe the reason my hair looks so crazy 
Let me see. Oh, see, yeah, that's a much more like, that's a better representation of my hair color right now. I just have the LUD on currently. Yeah, okay. I mean, I mean, I might watch it. I might watch it. What? Link it to me or something. Maybe I'll check it out. Link it to me right now and let me like just get a quick idea of what it's like. In the meantime, I've been playing Armored Core 3. I think I mentioned that. That game is very obtuse. I'm trying, you have to bunny hop in that game in order to move properly. It's insane. So I'm trying to get used to doing that. Let me see here. I'm getting ready for Tears of the Kingdom at some point. Cruelty Squad is rad. Cruelty Squad? What's that? The control scheme? The control scheme in the in Armor Core 3 is you move the camera and your character with your left analog stick. The right analog stick doesn't do anything. You strafe with R1 and L1. And you use L2 and R2 to like change like the, if you're looking up or you're looking down. It's crazy. All right, sorry. Now, you may have noticed that's an attention-grabbing title, you observant little thing, you. And to be fair, it is deliberately provocative. It came out eight years ago? Jesus. Uh-oh, cringe. I don't know. I have to watch it. Maybe it's not cringe. ...are rewarded for playing aggressively rather than playing defensively. In Monster 2 DOS, the useful- Monster Hunter for you is so unforgiving in so many ways. It's very forgiving in certain ways, but in other ways, it's insane. ...materials are obtained from small and large monster fights. The game requires the player to actively eliminate both small and large monsters. Every monster is out to attack the player. Small monsters should be eliminated first before tackling the large monster. The monsters yeah. have larger hitboxes that require the player to keep their distance and play defensively and carefully. In Monster 2 Dos, the small monsters can still pose a challenge for players even with endgame gear. Remobra have nearly as much health as a Velocidrome. The Lunastra fight at the top of the tower forces the player to fight three Renobra, which are three Velocidrome level monsters, while fighting the Lunastra. This it has what? It has what? Veloc Velocidrum level HP? Is that true? Cloudy Someone re Ely values annoying inconveniences <laughs> lol. Cloudy music and pro guys, thank you for the follow. I again I've said that like, you know, there's certain intentional design choices that are proven intentional that I do like, like hot and cold drinks. I think that was a fine mechanic. I think having areas of the game get too cold or too hot was cool. Um, making Remor Remobra have the same health value as a, what I am assuming is a low rank Velocidrome is insane behavior on the developer's part. While fighting a Lunastra, while fighting a Lunastra, like that is abysmal design. Like that is just so awful. This has never been the case in any Monster Hunter game to follow. The separation the between fuck? small and large monsters has become more apparent in fifth generation, separating the hunter's notes of small and large monsters. I theorize that Capcom never intended for there to be a separation between these in the original game, but with the prioritization of the DP- what do you fu what do you fucking mean, dude? What do you mean? Why would you suspect that? Why would you suspect that? They are clear they're clearly small monsters. They they literally do not take as long to kill as truly like large monsters. Like in this one situation, Remorbra for whatever reason have the same HP as a Velocidrome, which is insane. But they don't have the same HP as a Rathian, or a Rathalos, or a Gravios, or a Diablos, or a Lunastra, or a Tiastra, or a Kushala, or a Laoshan Lung, or a Shen Gao Ren. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know? You can't just have one example where Remobra have the same HP value as specifically Velocidrome, and then you're like, yeah, there was not supposed to be any distinction between large monsters and small monsters. There's Velocipray and Velocidrome. There is your distinction. Bull Drome, Bull Fango. If there wasn't supposed to be a distinction, they wouldn't be in the game. They are distinct from one another. PS boss fights in the newer games, it has become the norm ever since Monster Hunter Portable. Monster Hunter Rise has attempted to bring back focus on small, small monsters, monsters don't but fails areas, no. by making them too passive and giving them low health pools. They will never be the danger that they were in Monster Hunter 1 or 2. Small monsters have progressively gotten more docile. In Monster Hunter World, they That's would true. rarely attack the player. In Monster Hunter 2 DOS, they will spot the player hunter from all the way across the other side of the zone and charge the player and relentlessly attack them. Yes. Comparing the behavior of crabs in Monster Hunter 2 DOS to Monster Hunter 4 4G shows exactly what I mean. In Monster Hunter 4G, the players can stand next to these monsters and after spending 20 seconds taunting the player, will they finally attempt to attack. It's not like the player has to fight back anyway, the Palicos will probably just kill the monster for the player. Crouching can prevent the small monsters from spotting the player, but it's never as practical as simply slaying them. What if I told you that the intended effect of having small monsters was to beef up the amount of stuff in the map and make the game feel a bit more alive just by having them be present. Like what if let's assume that was the design choice. So if that if that was the case then making them more docile isn't actually an issue, right? Cuz it's the intended design that they just be there. And they just roam around and they just do stuff. They just happened to be very aggressive in one game. Two games, technically. I do think that they should be somewhat aggressive, but because I agree, I do think they got too docile overall. But the I don't think the intended effect of the small monsters was to completely fuck your shit in while you're trying to hunt a Lunastra. And that was the final boss, so I might get credits? Yeah! Who's the... Beezig, thank you. Who's the final boss of Village in uh, Dos? Is it uh, Lunastra? Ending cutscene! Wow! What's Lunastra like in, in DOS? Is it like just Tiastra reskin or does it have new moves? Wow, I did- I beat Monster Hunter 2! In Monster Hunter games, it is typically agreed upon that the end game starts after the final boss is defeated. Whether that be Monoblos in Monster Hunter 1, or Cedius in Monster Hunter 3, or Xenojiva in Monster Hunter World. I would instead argue that the end game actually begins when the game prioritizes the combat above all else. No one, no one believes that. Crouching can. Wow. Typically agreed upon. Oh, I did. I beat Monster Hunter two. In Monster Hunter games, it is typically agreed upon that the end game starts after the final boss is defeated. No, it doesn't, because you were talking about specifically the village final boss. What else do I do in village? After. What else do I do in village in Monster Hunter Three Ultimate after I I I beat Cedius. I like there's like a Diab there's a uh there's a devil joe quest, there's like the monster hunter quest where like you fight like four monsters and maybe a maybe I think there's a village Alatreon. So like three extra bonus hunts. I wouldn't call that the end game of three ultimate. The end game of three ultimate is is HR grinding and hub and you don't reach that until you defeat Dire Morales, right? So it's typically agreed upon that the end game starts after the final boss is defeated. No, it's not. Whether that be Monoblos in Monster Hunter 1. I don't know. I didn't play it. Or Cedius in Monster Hunter 3. No, it's not. Or Xenojiva in Monster Hunter World. Xenojiva is literally a completely different example because Monster Hunter 
world doesn't have a village structure system. We're, you're just talking about post-village. The real meat of Monster Hunter is in hub. It's always been in hub. It's always been hub. Village is just like this extra bonus content for your single player until we get to four ultimate. Maybe three ultimate if you want to count that. Yeah, Xeno is the, the hub final boss. Yes, I agree. And then we started to get bonus end game content after that point because that was a completely different service model. That was a live service model that they were running there. world i would instead argue that the end game actually begins when the game prioritizes the combat above all else for those who haven't played monster Hunter one it's only after the player defeats monoblos that they unlock gravios diablos and kezu and these monsters are considered extra bonus hunts it's at this point that the quest lineup is only difficult large monsters no gathering no small monster quests With that but you still need to it's just three bonus quests it's not, it doesn't, it, it It didn't just suddenly turn into a DPS boss rush. You're still going to have to like prepare for those fights in Monster Hunter 1. It's Monster Hunter 1. You're gonna, You're still going to have to get like tons, you're still going to have to do tons of gathering. That logic in mind, I'd argue that the end game of- I mean, Oh my God. Not, not that he's saying this, but like imagine like enjoying unlocking Gravios. Monster Hunter 3 actually begins after the player has defeated Legiacris. At that point onwards, the game prioritizes mostly hunting quests and stops requiring gathering quests or small monster quests. Stops requiring them as key quests. Stops requiring them as key quests. It still requires you to do gathering and facilitates you quests to f make that the focus. They, they decided that it's better at, at the time they decided that it's better to introduce people to the concept of gathering and preparation in monster hunter so that they know that they have to do it to prepare to hunt monsters then everything after that is about hunting monsters because you did the tutorial you've done the tutorial so you know you need to gather items. Just because it's not a key quest doesn't mean it's not required. In Monster Hunter 4, it's after the Gore Megala, and in Monster Hunter World, that would be after the Great Jagris. Um, Bro. Yeah, this train of thought is subjective. And Bro, you have one gathering quest in Monster Hunter Dose. What are you talking about? You already said at the beginning of the video, there's only one gathering quest. Like, what are you talking about? I think it's lost its point. The takeaway I had is that there is a moment in each Monster Hunter title where the game stops being a hunter-gatherer game and just becomes a hunter game. By that logic, that is at the very beginning of Monster Hunter Dose. Because there is only one gathering quest and it's the first thing you do. Which I guess is in the name of the series. The game will begin... He said it, like, ugh. Begin to provide the player more ease of access to consumables and pushes the player to- Watching me with a, an emergency alarm going on in your building? Prioritize hunting and grinding slash repeating the same hunts over other activities. Back in Monster Hunter 1 and Monster Hunter 2 Dos, once the player has reached my interpretation of- I swear to God, like, I swear to God, like, like, just imagine if he went into, like, a four-player hub in online and realize that he had to do zero gathering because everything is piss easy because you're doing it with four people like what then what happens then of the end game they slowly go through each of the unlocked final large monsters one at a time as challenges just like the modern monster hunter titles the difference is they cannot truly grind these fights the game requires the player to partake many quests in between each of these final challenges to stockpile the necessary resources What? So wait, wait, does he like it or he doesn't like it in Monster Hunter 1? 
If the player fails the quest, they'll have to spend some time stockpiling before attempting it again. Nobody nobody fails a quest in Monster Hunter. Everybody knows that you abandon or turn your PlayStation off before the final cart. That's just like a That's just like an obvious tactic. Every decision is deliberate and critical. Of course, the other option is to go They literally gave you the ability to cancel the like abandon the quest and you lose the money you put into the quest, but you keep all of your stuff speedrunner mode and just learn the monster's attacks and patterns and learn to counter them without any consumables. I had to do this a couple times. The archaic controls don't exactly make it easy though. Look, you don't actually need to play Monster 2 Dos like I've described it. If you're good enough at this game and you just never get hit, you just play really really well, then, then do that. This is old school Monster Hunter, you really only had to hit the monster like 25 times. This is back when a greatsword hit could, like, one-hit kill of Velocidrome without any buffs. If the controls... Are you tell you're telling me he made this huge point about how Remorbra had the same HP as Velocidrome, like, that was a very important fact but a great sword will one shot it anyway because a great sword one shots a velocidrome so all you have to do in that lunaster fight is is hit three remorbra once each and maybe multiple times like after or like maybe get multiple in one swing that's what i'm trying to say so what is the importance of the small monsters being there if they're so easy to get rid of? Because they're not that easy to get rid of, in my opinion. They, they fuck your shit in. So, but the HP thing meant nothing now. It meant nothing now. <laughs> that entire argument's gone, man were like the modern games and there weren't consistently like six other small monsters attacking you alongside the big one this game wouldn't be too difficult right i've seen the common complaints that the hitboxes are terrible in the older titles everyone hates the plesioth the plesioth has a massive hitbox why did he say it like that Why did he say Plesioth? Plesioth? So what? Learn the monster and keep your distance. Every time he jumps out of the water, just wait for him to shoot water and smack his head. It's the safest spot to be. Hitboxes are hitboxes. With each game, hitboxes are getting tighter and tighter. But ultimately, it doesn't matter how tight it is. If the game is designed to punish the player for attacking the legs, then just don't attack the legs. Use a different there, there's a little truth there that like you know what that's not that's not that bad yet that that's not that bad like, like he's basically just saying like he's basically just saying like people complain about the hitbox but at the end of the day that it is what it is and you need to learn to play around it which is true now we can still criticize it and we can still say that they f have been fixing it in later games. But he makes it a point earlier that making them tighter was bad. So that's so it does retroactively imply that he thinks big hitboxes are good. Hello, Jax. Different strategy. Sure, it's a. I don't. You can just hit Plesios legs. You don't have to get punished for hitting Plesios legs. You can just like roll under him and shit. When did he decide Monster Hunter got bad? No, that was that's a different video. That's a different video. This one's about how Monster Hunter lost its way, but is still good, but is not good as a Monster Hunter game, but it's still a good game, kind of. Slower fight than the other monsters, but Monster 2 DOS wasn't about fast. He didn't make, no, no, no. There's a different video that somebody else made called like Monster Hunter got bad.
It's DPS, it was about strategizing and thinking carefully. The tighter hitboxes in current Thank games has only made hitting the monsters easier, which has likewise caused the developers to increase the monster's health. Halo did get bad. Is Halo good now? Did I miss that? Is Halo Infinite good? I didn't play it. Oh, he thought the series... He, it's not even charm necessarily. He thinks it lost the survival aspect that was a big part of its character in Monster Hunter 1 and 2. That's what the entire video is about, so I can't really like recap it. Now the hunts require the player to hit the monster more. It's less about being extremely careful and deliberate, but rather about prioritizing getting as many. You gotta watch the possible. VOD. Obviously, the player is still required to telegraph well, and learn the monster. If you watch monster, the VOD, you'd go through the video with But with tighter hitboxes, a skilled player will be taking relatively less hits due to hunter positioning in relation to the monster compared to the older titles. And a non-skilled player is simply just going to tank through the attacks because of their unlimited potion supply. Monsters also tend to do more AoE attacks and range attacks now, so it's all just a balancing act. Alatrion and Iceborne is an interesting... Alatrion? ...fight. It has very tight hitboxes and with practice, the player can quickly memorize the patterns and learn to take advantage of them. He'd be easy if it wasn't for the incredibly high health number he has. On one hand, it reminds me of the old games, because careful player positioning is key. But it's also Monster Hunter Is he saying that Al Alatreon's only easy in world because, or only hard in world because of his high HP? World, so it requires prioritizing DPS. The this is the DPS boss fight. Yeah, this is it. This is the one DPS boss fight. The DPS checks are specifically to make the player prioritize. Don't be mean to Jacob. Just remember that he doesn't feel this way anymore. Mostly. As DPS. The concept of DPS check is interesting on its own. The reality is, is that ever since the first game, every single quest has a DPS timer. It's the 50 minute timer. If the player doesn't kill the monster in 50 minutes, the quest ends in immediate failure. But why punish the player for taking too long? Why did the developers put a 50 minute timer in the quest at all? Was it because of multiplayer? Back to the Plesiaw, the Plesiaw fight in Monster 2 Dolls is extremely difficult. It's because of the small monsters, as well as the Plesioff's AI, which is programmed to stay in the water for most of the hunt. I can't, the player I can't must kill handle how he says Plesioth. I think it's a good question to ask, though. Why? I, I don't think I've... I don't think I've ever actually asked why the game has the timer. Go away, freaks. I would say it's because of multiplayer. I'm like Googling what people, cause like, I don't think anyone's ever answered this, but uh, I think it's cause of the multiplayer. And then I, th I think it's because of the multiplayer and then they always just kept it in because it's just part of the game. And it somewhat adds to the challenge because like if you aren't ready for a fight, you're gonna time out. There have been fights where I have timed out. And that basically just means like, look, you either need to like get better or you need better gear. It, it's kind of like a check, right? I imagine that they like, yeah, I imagine it's like a pacing thing because they, they, they would in testing see, they're like, man, this dude took like two hours to kill this Plesioth. That is ridiculous. We don't want players taking two hours to kill a single monster that's crazy that's crazy especially since they can't save mid hunt people have lives and they want to be able to they don't want to be stuck in a two hour encounter so let's limit them to something reasonable let's limit them to 50 minutes and assume that they'll beat it before that that's almost i would say for certain what the idea is all the small monsters before they face the Plesioth. The player must wait for the Plesioth to exit the water and then attack its head and keep the distance. Taking it slow is fine, but eventually the player will start to run out of time in the quest. This is not nearly as stressful as Iceborne Alatrion, but my point is that tighter hitboxes is partially why there's been a focus on DPS. And no more dps checks aside from the typical fit no the reason plesioth takes forever is because he jumps in the fucking water it's not even his hitbox his hitbox is what kills you 
the time comes from the him being in the water because he was a terribly designed fight. The minute timer. A good strategy for Plesioth and Monster 2 Dos is to poison it. While it swims in the water, it'll be poisoned and thus damage is being dealt even if the player can't actively attack it. Sure. Was this the intended way to defeat Plesioth? What is the proper intended way to defeat Plesioth? What did the developer- There is no intended way to defeat any monster until like... World. There is no intended way to defeat a monster. You have 14 weapons. All of the weapons need to be viable in terms of killing a monster if that monster shows up in the village. You can't expect a player to switch weapons all the time. The developers can't expect that anyway. Every weapon has the ability to kill a monster in village. It just it comes down to like player skill. That you, all you need to do to beat a monster in this game. Yo, fly in, raid, soda. Um, Cell doing the slam dunk. A uh, VTuber. Um, chat was cleared by a moderator, prevented by better TTV. Okay, fly in, clear chat for non moderators. What did you do? What the fuck did you do? What's shield mode? What did you do? One month followers only mode for this room? Turn all that shit off. What are you doing? <laughs> what the fuck? Why did I make you a mod on my channel, bro? <laughs> Oh my god. Oh, it highlights everybody that's a raider now. That's crazy. Welcome to the stream, everybody. Hopefully you're having a good day. Bro, how are you still watching this video? Uh, no, this is the second stream of me watching it. You have a lane tattoo? That's sick. That's awesome. Welcome to the stream, everybody. We're we're roasting uh, Jacob for making the dose video. Currently, his, he's talking about how Plesios hitbox was in fact a good thing and making hitbox more fine-tuned was actually a bad thing. Yeah, actually, I just fin I finished the f most of the script for the... No, we're not at the colonization part yet, man. I, I believe there's an argument to make, make about colonization in, like, world, but, like, I don't know what his argument is, and I'm, like, scared. Um, But uh, I finished the Oblivion's... Um, I finished the Oblivion Vita script... I'm pretty sure it's going to be over 12 hours, so we'll see. I have to confess, I pronounced it Plesioth. I have never heard someone pronounce it Plesioth until today. I am, like, I'm getting, like, psychic damage from so many aspects of this video. I don't know where to watch it legally. I know where to watch it illegally. I don't know where to watch it legally. What are your thoughts on the video so far? I'm, I'm going to be real with you guys. You're going to have to like watch the VOD because there's so much. Um, but it, it it's basically like for whatever good point Jacob makes, we are then bombarded with a lot of like either inaccurate or obtuse points. And like some just don't make sense. That will like as an example. First want the player to do aside from, you know, using a range. Currently he's asking what is the intended way to fight Plesioth. And we were just discussing how there isn't really an intended way to fight Plesioth, you know. Oh, that's what I was talking about. Every monster, like I was saying, every monster needs to be defeated, needs to be possible to be defeated using every weapon if they present themselves in village at the very least, because I don't think a player justifiably should be expected to learn multiple weapons. They can, but I don't think it should be a requirement. Um, and I think that's facilitated because there are plenty of ways to deal with, to dodge the hitbox with Plesioth and still stay in. No, he doesn't play online at all. That was, oh, that was so frustrating. That was so frustrating. <laughs> Cause so much stuff that he could, that he talks about is about difficulty in this game is completely remedied by playing hub. Like he complains about the money. It's like, well, just play hub. Not that he can, like to be to be fair, you can't play hub here, right? You can't play hub here because it's, it's it's dose. The the private servers aren't up yet, so I get that. But you have to at least consider it. Yeah.
Yeah, I know. You can, like, glitch your way into it or something. But I'm talking about, like, the hub experience. So running with at least two people, maybe up to four people. The minute you run with four people, the game's, like, it's a casual co-op simulator, you know? Yeah, I'm looking forward to having a dose save file so that when the ser servers come out, I can then clear the hub stuff. Are you saying players are expected to play online? No, I am not saying that. Well, I would say that DOS and G are the intended experience is to be played online for sure. Like the most, like almost all, like the majority of the content's online. You're only getting to high rank online. You know, you're only getting to G rank online. Like you are expected to play online. But what I what I was just talking about is the fact that the arguments that are being presented as issues um, would be remedied by playing online. And since the expected experience is that you will be facilitating, you will be you will be playing online, the game at the time didn't facilitate certain things very easily for the solo experience. And so they end up getting framed in the video as like intended things that added to the survival aspect of the game because they were so difficult in comparison to how easy the game is now but they weren't intended to be difficult because you were supposed to be playing online and therefore would be making a fuck ton of money and getting a fuck ton of stuff to bring into your single player experience uh for you's hub is not single player balanced uh, i'm pretty sure almost every monster hunter hub is balanced for like 1.5 to, to three people like it, it's it's within that range four people's too much like it, it like at that point you're overpowered three people is okay and like two, two's like in my opinion the sweet spot doing duo quests is like the sweet spot Gonna make a seven hour rambling video about Devil Joe eating his own tail. Uh, Sneed's views. Talk to you later. See ya, man. Yeah, 2.5. Sorry, that's that's the number I was looking for. 2.5. Yeah. So, I, like, Hub is never tuned to one person, but almost every Monster Hunter game, if not every Monster Hunter game, can be completed fully solo, right? Maybe not every hunt, but I'm sure like there is where there's a will, there's a way. Like I know Fly Ann was tearing his hair out with uh, Jen Moran, for example, um, which could be soloed, but like he couldn't solo it properly because he couldn't get past it because it's a key quest, right? And so he ha and there wasn't a way to play with people at the time. So that that was a specific convoluted ex example because of the situation with the online hub. But you know what I'm you get what I'm saying weapon. Logically, a monster that ecologically prefers to attack from a safe spot in the water would do so. I am just of the mind that this is just not a good design for a fight. I don't think letting a monster go into a safe zone um, for long periods of time uninterrupted, even though we could have means of getting him out, limited means of getting him out, I just I don't think it's a good system. I would consider this an immersive element. In Monster Hunter 3G, the player can simply follow Plesioth into so the water and continue the fight underwater. So much better. The immersion is not lost in this aspect. Fights like the per one against Plesioth in Monster Hunter 2 Dos are perfect rare in modern Monster Hunter titles, Plesioth. which is why the best one I could compare it to was Elatrion. <laughs> this is why I'm fairly certain that the developer's design philosophy mentality in the modern titles is to prioritize DPS boss fights. If Plesioth returns in he any of the again. future games, we shouldn't expect the fight to be anything like how it was in Monster 2 Dos. Flying Plesioth is much in its original more simplistic state just takes too long and to fight, faster. and the developers want DPS boss fights, Maybe not, try, not a slow and does that fishing boss. All the time. If it's not a DPS boss fight, remove it, instead of improving it. Even when they did improve it, like in Monster 3G, it was using a feature, Underwater Combat, that didn't return in future titles. Instead of adjusting underwater combat to be less clunky, yeah, but like, it was just abandoned. Plesioth only returned back in MHGU, and I feel like they designed him so that he would come out of the water more, right? Because I don't, I don't remember fighting him and him being in the water all the time. And better solutions exist outside of prioritizing DPS boss fights. Bro, do we have a counter? Did anybody ever actually go through the video and count how many times he says that? The prototype footage from Monster Hunter World shows a very different game, where the player can lure one monster out by baiting another monster, just as the player could
we don't that is not what that shows i just realized that he said that that is not what that shows hold on the the tech demo shows the tech demo shows that he lands that the aftonoth lands in the water it lands into the water where there is an area and and laggy is just there and so a turf war happens he didn't lure laggy in it just it, cr it created a turf war and earlier in the video we were talking about how that's a cool mechanic how we can bait a monster to another monster and, and start a turf war that is what happens in the tech demo it's not different to use a frog to fish out plesioth the plesioth could be pulled out of the water in other ways the plesioth was given a cameo role in monster 4 the monster is still in the game and the players can still receive materials from the monster without actually going on this long and tedious hunt it's not a perfect solution, but it's something. Another example, Elder Dragons shows don't up in get GU. repelled anymore. The player is now required to slay them within a single quest. For newer players uh. who may not know this, in Generation 2, Elder Dragons had very high health numbers, and it proved difficult to slay them within a single quest. If enough damage was dealt by the 25 minute mark in the quest timer, the Elder Dragon would leave the hunting map altogether and go to a different map. Cool the quest would still be considered a success, and Good its mechanic. health would be carried over to the next time the player chooses to fight it. In Monster 2 Dos, if the map that the dragon went to was inaccessible because of the season, the player would have to wait for the season to change before they can finish the fight. The season and time of day system went hand in hand with this repelling system. This builds on the immersion element. I would, I would fucking hate it. I would hate it if I was in the middle of fighting Kushala because I needed like one Kushala piece, right? I need one more thing to finish my set. I'm fighting Kushala. I... Sorry, I just, someone posted a picture of their foot in my Discord or something, sorry. <laughs> That's so fucking, not my Discord, a friend, different Discord. It was just on my screen. <laughs> sorry. I would really hate it if um, <laughs> I was fighting Kushala and I needed something from it and it repelled and then I just didn't have access to the quest anymore. That would suck. That would suck. That is not a fun experience element in my opinion elder dragons are regarded as significantly more powerful than average monsters within the game's lore trailing the monsters across different maps is oh yeah he also equates he thinks that there's no distinction dis, he thinks there's no distinction between large monsters and small monsters interesting mechanic that has been left behind Until because it doesn't entries. hit the quota of fast dps boss fights now players slay elder dragons within a single quest they yeah i did no hold on it's not it's not like a foot it's like a gif of a, of a foot with sunglasses on. I'm not making it better, but yeah, fuck Eve. <laughs> Why did you post that? That's so funny. Okay. What a weird. Do gift. not get repelled, and if you wait for them to be repelled, they it'll and like end silly in string for hair. I, I'm the not making numbers that up. are now similar to other large monsters. Bizarrely, they remove the mechanics behind. I do agree that like Elder Dragon should be more of a threat in the newer games. They 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 definitely nerfed Elder Dragons. Except for like the big new crazy ones, all of the older ones get like pretty normalized into being just like a large monster with like a few extra features. The Diora to lower its wind barrier in Monster Hunter World. The equivalent now is Elder Seal, which is fine, but why remove the other functional method? Yeah, they brought it back. Elder Seal was like an experiment they tried. Another method in Monster 2 Dos was to cut off the tail and break the horn. What hot takes were covered so far? A Plesioth hitbox was good actually. Small hitboxes are bad actually. Um, small monsters and large monsters, there shouldn't be a distinction between them. Um, other stuff. This would also take down Cachello. This, this entire section, the DPS section, has by far been like the most frustrating part of the video. Wind barrier. This option was removed in Monster Hunter 4. It's so at 5 p FPS because he somehow got world running on a Mac at the time. Seems odd. It was a logical strategy that was built around the monster's biology. Learning the monster's biology leads to a better hunter, right? Having options is great, so why did he remove them, Capcom? They only re wait. Are they? Are we still on the Kushala thing? They only removed it in World because they were trying to add a focus to Elder Seals, and then they realized it was stupid and they got rid of it.
Another method in Monster 2 Dolls was to cut off the tail and break the horns. This would also take down Coachella's wind barrier. This option was removed in Monster 4. Seems odd. It was- Was it? No, there was something you could do to make him stop having black smoke or black wind, right? What was that? I'm pretty sure still breaking his head did that, didn't it? No, 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 not, no, through breaking parts of his body. I swear there was something you could do by breaking parts of his body. Let me, let me quickly, let me quickly look. Let me see what we're cooking here. Yeah, I think breaking the head stopped access from Dragon Wind. So I don't know. <laughs> so that, that's just a wrong statement. Learn flash problems properly. Kashala has weird timing. You great sword again for specific. Try to rock steady. Use Kashala rush around you. Learn the positioning where you can head level three charge him when he's tripping. Trust me. He's one of the most fought monsters. Or flash bomb. Bring poison. No one's talking about breaking his head, but I swear breaking his head does something. You could in for you, you can only break his head with dragon element. I don't think so. Uh, there's a, there's a whole Kushala playthrough I have in the VOD channel. So let's quickly, like, I'm going to take a quick second here. I'm going to boot up my uh, channel here. I'm going to go to my channel. Don't play that, please. There's my MH4. You. When did I fight him? Shout out to uh. Oh my god, my audio was so loud there. Is this Okay, so I'm fighting Kushala. I'm dying to Kushala. Oh, now I'm fighting Golden Rathian? What the fuck? Oh, did I beat Kushala? Let's go. Oh no, I was having so much trouble with Kushala that I started to hunt Metal Rathian and shit. Okay, here we go. Get poisoned. Why isn't he poisoned yet? What does it take? I'm gonna reload. Don't charge. Yeah, I had to farm for the poison weapon. Charge me. I know hitting the head topples him, and toppling him stops the, uh... Oof. I swear that I just, I remember Oof. permanently stopping his wind. Got me right in the goo. Not all of it, like, he would still have the basics, but he, we stopped the black wind, I thought. Oh, God. Did we not? Really tired of writing? I stop. Oh, that's fighting Eucanalus. That's a completely different fight. Okay. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe Jacob's right. Maybe I'm wrong. It was a logical strategy that was built around the monster's biology. Learning the monster's biology leads to a better hunter, right? Having options is great, so why did you remove them, Capcom? I don't think they did. Did they? I'm happy that's that section's done. That was that was hard. That was hard on me. This one's also very long. So this section is to discuss weapon and armor systems. I firmly believe that the new standards in weapon and armor abilities have caused a drastic increase in monster health over the years, which has also played a part in the focus of high DPS over deliberate careful action. To yes. compare, let's first look at the yes. health points of a low rank Rapalos from various titles. Please note that there is a chance any of these health numbers might be inaccurate but I personally trust these sources enough to use them. As we all know, these games do not give these numbers directly. These have to be calculated or gained through data mining. Low rank Raphalos. So some things to note, all the numbers here should be for low rank online multiplayer. All right. So he's getting his values for multiplayer. Didn't play multiplayer, but we're just saying that he got it from there. So that's fine. Before he gets into it, before he gets into it, he was he was explaining a sharp incline in damage up to Iceborne. If if you if you know anything about Iceborne, you already know where where that 
increase came from. You know the reason there's that increase. So we see, we see that it's more here, less here, less here, and then it only peaks in Iceborne specifically, and we all know why that is, and that's because it's Clutch Claw, right? Like we all we all get that, right? Because facilit they wanted to facilitate the use of the Clutch Claw, and therefore you had to weaken parts of the body to do more damage to them. Therefore, the monster had higher HP to try to promote you doing that, right? Oh, it's for the scaling. It's for the player scaling. That's fair, actually. I'm not wrong, though. T-Mac? You were streaming? That's crazy. What were you streaming? Thank you for the raid. Bro, shut up. Oh, my God. T-Mac is a local Digimon TCG friend of mine. Did you tell them to call me a scalper? I hate you. Thank you for the follows, Otter Slaughter and MapleCon. Appreciate it. Welcome to the stream. Right. I was not able to find accurate data for the third generation, so it's missing. Monster Hunter World's health numbers scale with multiplayer, so it only gets to be as high as like the 10,000 if there are three or four players on the quest. Monster 2 Dos and Monster Hunter Double Cross have fluctuating health numbers. These are randomly selected the moment the quest begins. They're not based on whether or not you're- But okay, did he not say it gets higher over time? Or did I miss something? Playing with more people. And also, Kiriniko's numbers for Monster Hunter 4G do not seem to be very specific. They also don't feature the variation in health numbers like the other titles do. I'm actually hesitant to call them accurate or helpful in this discussion, but I'm keeping them in there for comparison anyway, and I just pray that they are correct. Just from these numbers alone, the only takeaways I can make is that it may be in 4th generation the health numbers were dropped, but then they were picked back up in Monster Hunter World. Regardless, it seems that Monster Hunter World has some of the highest numbers, but nothing extreme. Now let's see the high rank numbers, again with the same context and notes. High rank Raphalos. This is where Monster 4G begins to feel inaccurate, though the data between Monster 2 Dos and Monster 2 Double Cross are actually pretty close to yeah, each I don't other. Believe but when we compare Monster 2 Dos and Monster lower. World, you'll see that the single player version of Raphalos and World is, there is actually about the same as the scaling online was Raphalos and Dos. World. Once it gets scaled for multiplayer, however, it sits at a whopping 14,000, which is nearly double that of an online Raphalos and Dos. That's not, that's not a fair comparison, especially if this came out when they had the full four player scaling. The other games didn't scale for four players. So running, running four players in Monster Hunter Cross is, it's, way easier because you're dealing with a 5,000 HP monster. The, again, we, we just talked about this. The game was scaled for 2.5 to 3 people or so, right? Anything above that is makes the game piss easy. So World's answer to that, even though it's still piss easy, was to scale to the number of players. That's why you're seeing this huge boost in numbers. He's, he's conflating data and he's trying to put reasoning to the data to like prove his point but the reasoning is completely unrelated you know like he he's it's a completely unrelated factor because one game had scaling and one game didn't moving on to g rank numbers monster 2 you dos never had a g garden? rank so i'll be using monster Hunter portable second g for the g rank equivalent of the second generation much of the equipment and balance for portable second g is pretty close to monster 2 dos so i'm hoping this is a fair replacement this is the G-Rank Raphalos numbers. It's at this point that it should be clear that the monster health has bloated immensely. No, okay. This is it. This is where Clutch Claw came in. This is Clutch Claw. Specifically Clutch Claw. So there's two things that aren't being taken into account here. We're not we're not actually taking into account we're not actually taking into account what the implications of player scaling means and we're not taking into account the bloated health values for Clutch Claws specifically that nobody liked. Nobody liked that. So all I am seeing here, we see some bloat in MHX and XX, which again, if you ran this with four people, it won't matter. X hypers don't matter. 
Um, it's actually better for high rank in MHX than it is in MH2 dose. I think his real issue is specifically this stuff. But this is not an accurate representation of anything because of four player scaling. Slee in fifth generation. Monster Double Cross had a bit of bloat, but that was because Monster Cross, the, the original game, uh, its endgame had a pseudo G rank with the inclusion of hyper monsters on the hyper monster upgrade system. The true G rank in Monster Double Cross is, was basically more of a G rank part 2. So the even higher numbers kind of make logical sense in that regard. What wow. seems kind of insane in the drastic increase is Monster World's G rank, which is nearly four times greater than Portable Second G when oh playing. Oh my God! Come on. Playing in single player, but it's nearly eight times greater when you play with three other hunters. I'm sure other players have noticed this while playing Monster. Why do you think that is? That's because they have player scaling and because of the clutch claw. Like this shit is reasonable. This makes a hunt go like slightly normal time, maybe based off of like if we have four people, if we have three people, if we have two people, if we have one person, right? Hunts hunts are now just like almost always the same speed, regardless of how many people you have, kind of. Monsters actually still get very overpowered. This is because of Clutch Claw specifically. This is this is a huge outlier that says nothing about your point. This is you're you're pointing to a disgusting outlier here that proves absolutely nothing. So no world iceborn. The health numbers are drastically bloated compared to even high rank numbers. The easy scapegoat seems to be the clutch claw, which is absolutely reasonable. The clutch claw was essentially required to abuse during any hunt as it allowed for dealing massive damage numbers when the monster was sent Wait, into a pause. wall or pause. became my head my headphones come up hold on i don't know what the point is right now i think he's saying that the hp values got bloated as the game went on but he also showed that isn't true because they didn't get bloated here and they didn't get bloated here and they didn't get bloated here except for this, except for this. And he explained why that was. And these don't count because of player scaling. It's absolutely reasonable. The clutch claw was essentially required to abuse during any hunt. Sorry, what did you say? Like Mizu and Jiu high rank village is average 5.8 and hub higher tier is average 6k. Hunt, as it allowed for dealing massive damage numbers when the monster was yeah, average hunt times would be better. Tenderized by the average hunt times would be way attack. better than the the clutch pulls. claw also affected the power of tenderizer. But he's trying to say that like you to facilitate those hunt times, you have to like super focus on DPS. I think already a very powerful armor skill. The game was balanced, knowing the player could abuse these features. So they had to increase the health numbers accordingly. Yes. There is also a large number of environmental traps and triggers that can do massive damage to the monster. Yes. The turf war gimmick also allows for damage to be dealt. Yes. Being able to restock the player's entire item supply. In yes. When they when they facilitate uh, a bunch of new features that deal heavy damage, they're going to raise the HP of the monster to to encourage you to use those mechanics, which you should like because it's adding to the experience and not just making it a DPS boss fight. Now you're encouraged to drag the monster around, hit them with the environment, turf war them up, you know? According to you, that should all be a positive things and the HP bloat shouldn't be an issue. Infinitely also leads to abuse. See, I find this to all have an air of contradicting design philosophy. Take for example, the player doesn't use any environmental traps or gimmicks at all and, and focuses primarily on the abilities as a skilled player. The player will DPS their way to victory. This is fine. Depending on their skill level and their equipment, they may finish the quest very fast or very slow. There are a lot of variables there. Meanwhile, for yes. another example, the player bases their tactics slowly around environmental traps and gimmicks. I don't think it's possible to actually kill any of the monsters using gimmicks alone. The player is still required to complete the quest through DPS and player skill with a weapon. You are required in every Monster Hunter game 
to complete the quest through DPS. The game isn't expecting you to, to kill the monster using solely the environment. Those are flavors to add to the experience. Weapon. So why were the gimmicks added at all? They don't do much, especially in G-Rank where the health numbers are inflated so much. It seems the developers still want the player to play the game like there aren't any environmental traps. I can understand. The environmental traps also give you an opening to do huge damage to the monster. It causes a guaranteed topple. understand the argument that the player is meant to incorporate both gimmicks and normal play into the hunt, but usually just playing well with the weapon is more advantageous and deals more damage overall. This is an interesting rabbit hole to go down, but it does not suit my video. The topic of environmental gimmicks are something that should be discussed separately from this video. Feel They are not there to be a substitute for attacking the monster. They are there as bonus damage. They are there as bonus damage. It's a bonus. Free to let me know in your thoughts below. I do think it's interesting that they did remove environmental traps from Monster Hunter Rise, and it's also interesting to note that the didn't aren't they still in Rise? Isn't there like molten things you can hit? Time attack wiki rules for speed running have all environmental traps considered forbidden. Take that as you will. What are you implying there? The speedrun thing is about, they decided it's about just using your weapon. That means nothing. Who cares what the speedrun rules are? That means nothing to the general audience. Returning to the discussion of inflated monster health, Holy I believe shit. the actual main reason the monsters have such inflated health is See, because Dooku. of the new armor system introduced in Monster Hunter World. They have made it extremely easy to stack skills that raise attack and affinity. Attack up level 7, which increases this is attack true. by this 21 is... and affinity by 5%. Yes. Elemental attack up level 6, which increases elemental damage by 20% and adds a straight 100 on top. Element attack level 4, which increases ailment build up by 30%, plus another 10 ailment. Critical Apply level 7 increases affinity. Ailment? Ailment. By 40%. Critical boost level 3 increases damage dealt with critical hits by 40%. Weakness exploit level 3 increases affinity by 30% when attacking a monster's weak point. It also increases it to another 20%, making it 50% on wounded parts. Critical draw level 3 increases affinity on draw attacks by 100%. Latent power level 7 increases affinity by 60%. Agitator level I get what he's going for here. I mostly agree. I don't think you're going to have all of the things he mentioned on at the same time. And some of them like crit draw and stuff like that kind of change how you'll potentially play the weapon. So they do have their nuance and do affect the gameplay somewhat. So just lifts, listing off the stuff that makes you more powerful is not necessarily an accurate representation because we have, you know, we have attack up in, we have a we have attack up in for you. We have, it's it's probably in dose. We have critical eye. If you're playing gun lance, you have um, artillery, etc. I'm sure there's like some insect lave ones. Level 7 increases affinity by 20% and adds plus 28 to attack value. Peak performance level 3 adds plus 20 attack value. Heroics level 7, just... when the conditions are met, increases attack power by 40%. When the conditions are met, dude. When the conditions are met. Heroics? Fortify can increase your attack by 10%, and then another 10% can be stacked on top of that. Resentment level 5 adds plus 25 attack. Artillery level 7 increases specific attacks by 50%. Maximum Might level 5 increases affinity by 40% when stamina gauge is full. Affinity Sliding increases affinity by 30% after sliding. Crit Element increases elemental damage when landing critical hits. Crit Element increases ailment buildup when landing critical hits. Non-elemental Boost increases attacks on weapons that do not have an ailment or element. Blunt increases attacks as the weapon loses sharpness. Teostra's technique prevents the weapon from losing sharpness when landing critical hits. Free element adds an element or element to a weapon that normally wouldn't have one. Namiel's divinity adds free element and- Awakening has always been in the game. That's not fa 
Awakening's been in since at least four U, I think. Um, maybe three. Um, you're not going to have all of these on at one time. And additionally, because of the random nature of decorations in world specifically, you're definitely not going to have these all the time. And you're going to have to mix and match. Most likely, the, the high amount of attack bonus skills is because of the fact that you aren't guaranteed to have them. And the game does require you to become stronger through decorations in some capacity. And increases elemental damage. Frostcraft makes the weapon gain more attack as it's kept in its sheath. Offensive Guard level 3 increases attack by 15% after doing a well-timed guard. Coalescence level 3 increases attack by 18 there's what he's talking about one that increases your ability if you play really good the better you play the stronger you are that's crazy 15 percent elemental attack by 90 percent and element build up by 15 percent the Berioth hidden art adds a stun effect to draw attacks and increases attack safi jiva seal level 5 increases affinity by 40 percent increases elemental by 150 and element by 120. we all know that we don't care about there being a ton of affinity skills because all we need is one setup that will get affinity to 100%. That's all that matters. What maybe maybe that's a point. Maybe we can make that point that it's very easy to get 100 affinity in this game without any drawbacks really. That's a point. Alatrion Divinity increases elemental attack accordingly to elemental defense number. Getting 100% affinity in Monster World is so incredibly easy. It's become the norm to see a critical hit flash with every attack. I pose the question, why even have okay, a system of RNG critical hits at all when it's so easy to just guarantee them? True. In Monster to Rise, they even added a weapon that already has 100% affinity. This has never happened before. Yeah, but that's in just Monster one... To Dos, there are Wait. four skills... Hey, that's just one weapon, man. 100% of... What is this? The Ninja Sword has 100% affinity? Which, which weapon is this? High Ninja Sword. Does it have decoration slots at all? It does, it, does it have a rampage slot? It's got green sharpness. That is a misrepresentation of this weapon, man. That is a misrepresentation of this weapon. That is not a fair comparison. Affinity. This has never happened before. In Monster 2 Dos, there are four skills to increase attack or affinity. There's attack up. At level 3, it's plus 25 attack. Ailment up, which increases ailment by 125%. Ailment. Potential which at level 2 increases attack by 50% when health is below 40, and Reckless Abandon, which at level 3 is a combination of Mind's Eye, so weapons don't bounce, and it adds plus 15% affinity. Yo, that's busted. What do you mean? That's busted. I can get affinity plus 15 and have Mind's Eye in one skill? That's nuts. 15. That's all the player can increase their affinity. It 15 with Mind's Eye. Bye. 15%. The absolute highest a weapon affinity can reach in Monster 2 Dos is 45%. And that's only with certain endgame weapons that already have plus 30 affinity, and they're very uncommon in this game. Increases in affinity has led the developers to start adding more weapons with negative affinity to balance. Meanwhile, in Monster 2 Dos, not a single longsword, dual blades, hunting horn, gun lance, or light bow gun have a weapon with negative affinity. That's 5 out of the 11 weapon types available at the time without any negative affinity. And another thing, I want to discuss the power charm and armor charm. Both of these have been in the series since the very first title. Because money was more difficult to acquire, these were a luxury if the player could afford them. They slightly increased attack and defense similarly to attack up or defense up skills. Remember, in Monster Hunter 1, there was no feature to upgrade armor. When an armor piece was forged, the defense remained at whatever the defense was, so Oof. getting the armor charm was very valuable. These charms have importance as receiving the attack up or defense up skills were also less openly available. In Monster under one, there was no option to use decorations because decorations and talismans were not yet implemented into the series. Item space was extremely limited in Monster Hunter 1 and Monster 2 Dos. The player only had 20 spots in their item pouch. If the player prioritizes these charms, they lose precious item space. Compare this to Monster Hunter World, which offers the player significantly more item space, more than triple the original amount. It's become extremely yeah. easy to purchase these charms immediately in newer times. But it also, like, that's not fair. That's not... Did he just get the DLC shit? 
GU has like all this DLC that gives you like infinite money right away. That's one game that does that. And it's still expensive in try and three ultimate, and it's still and it's still expensive in four ultimate, and you still have limited inventory space. Like a lot of a lot of the gripes around Dose's loss of identity or Monster Hunter's loss of identity from Dose seem to generally mostly come from world specifically. So I don't think it's about Dose. I don't think this video is about Dose being the last bastion of a good Monster Hunter experience. I think it's about how world began to ruin aspects of that experience. Titles, usually around halfway through low rank. The Which he said was his second favorite game. Player will see them in the item shop, and I would be genuinely surprised if a player said that they weren't able to afford them in any title past Generation 3. Of course, Monster to Rise changed this. Gen 3 and Gen 4, except for GU, because of the DLC, it's hard to get them right away. You can't get them right away. That Monster Rise would- You could sell stuff and probably get them right away. But you need to buy two of each because you want to be able to make the talent. It was the first game in a while where I actually had to sell stuff in order to buy it. I do enjoy that in Monster Hunter 3 Try, the player can only get these charms via trading with the Argosy. I feel this encourages play- Argosy. Argosy. Players to play the game more to the simulation aspect, as they need to hunt the monsters for the village in order to get the items to trade for the charms. Overall, Good at this system. point in the series, these charms are just more of a mandatory buff that the game developers expect the player to carry in their pouch at all times, thus balance the game around it, thus increasing They're the monster guessing. health. It's obviously not possible to stack every single attack skill in Monster Hunter World all at once. That would be insane. There's, of course, limits. But my worry is that with more of these attack skills I mean, they being get pretty added, close. the more the monster that. Health will game. be inflated. The more the, the game full, will expect the player to build armor sets around the attack boost meta. In the older Monster Hunter titles, the player could maybe get one of the attack boost skills, and that would be extremely helpful in combat. However, the game was not built around the player having easy access to these skills. Rather, the game was built around knowing the player would likely be using other skills. That is the case for every Monster Hunter until World. That is this the, you just described the system that we've had for every game until world it's just been that system we got some more offensive skills in later games sure but the system has always been very limiting and only allows you to get a small quantity of skills at any given time like this is not some dose thing that they like had theft monsters like to steal items especially the cats they will make a beeline straight for the player and immediately steal supplies it's fast and aggressive monster 2 dose doesn't really require the player to have any specific attack boosting skills the armor skill attack boost is so minor and the player can get an equivalent boost just by eating a meal in their home rather the game requires the, the those should stack so it should actually be better to have both player to have health boost skills monster scouting skills or right? armor armor i think armor attack up and food attack up stack i think it's just demon drug and food attack that don't stack map skills or gathering skills as these elements require the player's time just as much as the actual make you twitch thank you for the raid appreciate it what's the mhu stand for Combat. Monster Modern University. Monster Hunter Welcome games are prioritizing DPS boss fights over other Actually, elements. We had three when I first played crazy. Monster 2 Dos, I found myself having more trouble with this. I feel bad. I feel bad because like we're about to finish, but I do appreciate it. I'll send. I'll send everybody some way. Small monsters and gathering materials, and that's just because I Welcome needed to, to change stream. the way I play Monster Hunter. I discovered that there's far more to this game series than just one-on-one -on -one DPS boss fights, and the series decided not to explore these concepts, but rather shut them down before they can be improved. I have a bold. They shut these. The concepts he's talking about got shut down in World. They had been improved on for two extra generations since he was talking about this and wacky suggestion to Capcom I'm gonna make based off of my completely personal subjective opinions. It'll be really quick, then I'll be back There's to the- There's still an hour and a half. ...objective stuff. Basically, I think the game would be better without any, any attack boost skills from armor whatsoever. 
we already have a viable method to increase attack, and that's by upgrading weapons at the blacksmith. Any additional attack boosts should be solely through food or item buffs. We should put more value on the power charm and food skills. Weapon proficiency and player skill are still what's ultimately important. Why, why are you signaling out armor skills specifically? Like, you, you have to ask yourself that question, I think. Like, should there be less... In, should there be less incentive on upgrading your attack in general outside of upgrade? Like, I feel like that's the point he wants to make. We should focus more on the upgrading of our weapons through to get attack bonuses using monster parts than through armor skills. That I think that's the better take he could be making. But here, he's, he's just signaling out armor skills but then being fine with food skills and and power charms and armor charms. It's still expensive to make the armor, and especially if you want to have a variety of sets. Like he's like, oh well, like maybe you should focus on gathering sets or gathering skills instead of the attack skills, and then you'll be more incentivized to do so. No, if I'm gonna have a gathering set, if I'm gonna have gathering skills, I'm gonna have a full gathering set that is made for gathering. I'm gonna have sets that specialize at different things. I can't, I, even if we got rid of it, I couldn't have an all rounder set. So I wanna have a damage dealing set that is best made for my play style and I wanna have a gathering set, and I wanna have like some other sets for other things. Things that things that complement different situations. I don't I don't get the need to signal out attack armor attack boosts specifically just because world and rise don't do them super well. Doesn't make sense to me. Numerous stat boosts are pointless when the monster will be balanced to match it anyway. Surely increasing numbers doesn't make the game any more enjoyable, not compared to playing to master the monster's movesets and player- I find the game more enjoyable the more effective I become by upgrading myself. It is both a skill game and- Monster Hunter is an RPG. Believe it or not, Monster Hunter is an RPG. I am leveling up my character by getting him new gear. He is becoming more powerful positioning and decision making. That's why people like speedruns. I firmly believe the game would benefit if armor skills focused primarily on defensive skills instead. This would open the window for players to prioritize counter builds to monster abilities. I found myself just learning to work through the pain of ailments such as paralysis or KO. I also just learned to- You have always done that. You have always worked through ailments such as paralysis and KO. I don't know what he means by paralysis and KO, but like, like I mean paralysis. Well, don't you only get KO'd if you have like electric stun? Yeah, okay. Um, we have a means of mitigating stun already in the game. And we have items that can help you get rid of certain ailments. And we have other like rolling to get rid of certain ailments. So you're not brute forcing your way through that stuff. You, like you are, you're dealing with a lot of it without needing like, like to, to the armor skill for that is, is flavor, you know? And it's not required of you to have like attack up armor skills until like the very, very end of like world and, and rise where shit is just like, so it does get bloated at the very end. I agree. I frame the effects of monster tremors. This is because I'm prioritizing attack boosts and yeah, I love for the using earplugs instead of you know I can, slotting. I love using earplugs. I can still fit in. I can still fit in shit. You know, I can still get attack stuff. Have my earplugs. I love. I will always fit in high grade earplugs in three ultimate. Always, they're so beneficial. And defensive skills that nullify paralysis or KO or monster tremors. Simply nullifying the effect altogether makes the hunt easier too. In Monster World, it becomes easier to nullify monster effects because of the new armor system, and obviously nullifying the effect altogether would make the hunt easier. Though, 
But Capcom decided to balance this by making the monster effects worse to deal with. And because Monster World made it easier to slot in decorations to cancel out these ailments, they had to balance the game by making the monster effects and ailments worse to it's deal with. This is a neat Gen idea. Sure. Unfortunately, the meta demands the player to prioritize Especially for long sword. The, the minute you the can insanely counter, high health numbers of monsters in G-Rank. Why even offer the player the ability to counter these monster effects and ailments while the game tries to teach the player to simply get good? It's, it's not doing that. It's not doing that. It's not. That's just such a weird thing. Um, that's it for today. I'm going to go... I'm going to go have dinner and cry myself to sleep. Shout out to Jacob. Again, nice dude. Great person. Some, some crazy takes. Crazy takes. But uh, it is what it is. Anyway, th thanks to Jacob for stopping by. That was cool. Hopefully he has a good day. And thank you for all the raids, guys. MHU Twitch, TMAC, Flyan, all very nice. I guess I won't do the outro today. I'll actually send you over to somebody. Let's find someone that's playing Monster Hunter Dose. Let me, let me look here. Thank you, Amy. Monster, they probably have it as Monster Hunter 2. I don't know, uh, Shady Goo, <laughs> thank you for the follow. Sorry, I guess I don't have it up here. <laughs> Wait, you gotta see the thumbnail for me on this. That's so funny. That's so funny. I'm gonna post it in Discord in the general chat. If you're in the Discord, you can see it there. I can't post it here. Oh, it's so funny. Uh, it's in the, It's just. It's just my face looking shocked, and it says "hot take" on the screen. All right. Um, who do we got? MH Tears of the Wyvern. That seems fine. I'm gonna send you to this guy. Droga. Just be nice. Check it out. How much drink you give me? What language? Oh shit, I don't think it's English. Damn. Okay, wait. There's one more I can check. No, this yeah, one's also not in English. Because uh, I want them to be able to talk to you, right? Like, um, let me try MH. Let's try Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate. Is anybody playing 3 Ultimate right now? Oh. I'm just going to trust Maybe that this is good. supplies are here? Yeah, here we go. Oh. All right, bye. There you go. Shout out to the Vodders.